This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 90, recorded on May 28th, 2015. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent. This is a wonderful spring day, isn't it? It is. It's actually kind of mucky out right now. Isn't it warmer than it should be? Uh, a little bit, but that's going to change. Our weather pattern will be changing dramatically over the next three days. Let's see. It's going to return to normal, which is like in the high 60s with inc incredible, as it may seem, because Buster I rain. trout fish and we haven't had any water in the rivers all spring. We haven't had rain since March. We had rain last night. And next week, yeah, we're getting rained, yeah. gentle rain. We're getting gentle rain all next week. Good. Which it's should restore the uh, aquifers. 24 Celsius. 24 it's Celsius. going up to about 28. Yeah, it's going to get muggy. It's but muggy right now. we have right an 85% chance of rain today. Uh, exactly. Also joining us today, Daniel Griffin. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Vincent, and hello to our listeners. How is everything with you? Okay. Is the island great? The you know the island the island has Wait. actually the island has been great. He's I, got I, a I great see, story for and us. I see He's, Dixon getting excited when yeah, you ask I, that. I've seen his story and you have to see it. And actually, my story made the news. In, in fact, I'm news? using that as my pick of the week for the next three weeks. And, and we're not talking about my latest uh, you know virology journal no, article, are we? We're talking I don't about know. the whales. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do so on Long Island last week? Look, I, I threw so it again. I'm back to so. I'm just that's you know my native <laughs> that's state. Well, so <laughs> last. Last week, I was at the retro virology meeting mm -hmm. at Cold Spring mm -hmm. Harbor. Correct. And there you are at the water. You're looking out. There's yeah. sailboats. Yeah. Well, I played hooky on Friday oh, afternoon. No. I had to. I had this this dear friend. He has this 50-foot uh, sailboat. He needed help sailing that boat from Huntington westward to Port Washington. Hmm. Right. And it was exciting sailing. We had gusts up to 50 miles an hour. Incredible. This 50-foot boat is almost is laying he, on its side. And the Long Island Sound is not very deep. Is that correct? Um, it's not as deep sound. as the, you're in the, sound. the ocean. We're in the sound, so it's somewhat protected waters. And it has a lot of rocks that you have to be wary of. We avoid the rocks. We avoid oh, good. the rocks. Okay, we, we stay where the water is deeper than <laughs> our draft. All right. Everything's great. We exciting sail. We get the boat on the mooring. The launch comes out to give us a ride to the dock. We're about 15 feet from the dock. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this big white thing rises up out of the water. And then another one. And next, we notice three of these. There are three beluga whales between us and the dock. Wow. And That's amazing. Apparently, these beluga whales, which are more of a northern Arctic Very whale, so. has hmm. migrated, and they were hanging out in our bay. Yeah. All the, you know, it was closed off by the uh, uh -huh. Coast Guard, no swimming. Uh, they had some military planes flying overhead, keeping track, basically sort of keeping boats from crashing <laughs> yeah, into these guys. It made the evening news on NBC, CBS, and ABC. They covered that story, and you were there. Oh, it was, it was amazing to see these without any warning. <laughs> so, that was, so things are going well on the island. <laughs> things are going very well. So uh, they just came a little bit out of the water and blow. They actually were rising out of the water. and yeah, Because they, they are mammals. They didn't they breach, breathe. though, right? They just no, they were not. They were not they to breathe. Belugas don't breach. They don't breach? No. Because they're not territorial. You're like going to get humpbacks. email if you're wrong. No, no, no. I, <laughs> hey, I knew Roger Payne. Do you know who Roger Payne was? Is Roger Payne recorded humpback whale songs first? He was at Rockefeller. No, no, they don't go like that. They go. <laughs> Some of them whistle, don't they? <laughs> no, right. Nice. <laughs> Are they talking when they do that? That's talk. But when they breach, it's actually male territorial behavior. Ah. And they're trying to ward off all the other males because there's a lot of females around and they want to mate with them, of course. The belugas don't behave like that at all. They behave, they're more gregarious, they're more pod-oriented uh, in terms of traveling in pods. Like our pod casting, <laughs> we pod in groups. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the belugas do that as well. Cool. Whereas the humpbacks are more solitary, and, and except during the mating season. And on certain occasions in the Arctic when they feed and they make bubble nests. Uh, no, I said that wrong. Bubble nets. They they go. The six or eight whales will blow out all their air or most of it and trap all the herring. Yeah. And then they'll all open their mouths and come up through the bubbles and 
eat the herring, and that's how they clever. It's it's a group behavior. Nice. Yeah, it's really very clever. Should we do a podcast on whales? No, but we could do a bubble net, uh, just as <laughs> an aside. <laughs> but I, I would have been thrilled to see these whales, though. Because I wonder if there's any whale experts in the world who want a podcast. I don't know how many podcasts you uh, could do, though. Right? Well, Roger Payne is still around. I know he is. He lives up in Vermont with his wife, mm. and he's a really nice guy, too. He, that, By the way, that, that lecture that I went to on the whale songs at Rockefeller when I was a postdoc mm -hmm. was the most widely attended lecture at Rockefeller that I was ever at. doesn't matter who was there, Nobel Prize winners, doesn't matter. They wanted to hear Roger Payne read the music of the humpback whale. And he did. He had sheet music up in front and everything, mm -hmm. and he pointed it out. And he, At that point, they didn't know what the songs meant. What key is it in? Uh, <laughs> hey, does, do you have an Apple Watch? He has an iWatch. I, I do. Actually, you know, I was noticing Jeez. that when you when you looked at cool. the weather, I was going to say, well, according to my Apple Watch, it's in the <laughs> high 70s and way oh, too humid which, out there. Which uh, version is this? Space Gray? Uh, this is... is that I the $20,000 one? No, no, no. It's the $349 So it's got version. a uh, aluminum case? Uh, I believe so. It, it but it's got the one that's black. And you're a sailor. Is, uh, is it waterproof? It is water resistant. resistant. It resists the water. What kind of band is that? Is that the, uh, the, the you know the black plastic fluoroelastomer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the, not a Milanese loop, right? No. no so guess what I nice. bought my <laughs> wife for her birthday? <laughs> yeah, one of those. I did, but did she you? hasn't bought it yet. Do you like it? Uh, it you know I say it is the fifth best thing that happened to me in my life. No, it was my wife, and my three it? kids. It's right in front of the dog. I'll be can darned. See, can you hold it up and let me? <laughs> Wait a minute. What about so, Twip? <laughs> uh, when you uh, <laughs> when you lift it up, does it automatically come on? Is that it, that's you can set it. You can say to stay on all the time and well, suck cool, the battery huh? life, or activate when, when I turn you lift it on. Up. You know, I'm gonna yeah, have Marlene options. come over and talk with you about this because she's got the gift certificate. Okay. She's not bad know. looking, actually. It's a beautiful watch. I have a watch that, with a rubber band because I go in the water a with rubber this. rubber band? Yeah, it's rubber. It's made of rubber. See, Can this is made for me to sail with, but my other watch is all broke, right. so I wear it all the time. Right. It just tells the time and the date. Oh, what okay? else do you need to know? Well, I like wearing a watch, actually. I have, I like the feel. Oh, I do, too. Time. I have a Swiss Army version that's water-resistant. Yes. Also, because I go fishing a lot, and I, I was at, a, my hands in at the a Gordon conference once, and uh, we're, this very f well-known scientist, uh, Richard Lerner, uh, was yeah. there, and uh, he, he was talking to us with his arms folded, and my friend Bob Lamb looked at his Rolex, uh -huh. and he said, you're doing well, aren't you, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> no, he bought it on 42nd Street from a Nigerian watch dealer. Yeah, what is that green stuff on your arm? <laughs> That's right. And by the way, the hands are not moving. <laughs> we have lots of responses to the TWIP 89 case email. Oh, that's we, we did. And actually, one of the, you know, I listen to these, these TWIPs offline. And one of the things we sometimes do and sometimes don't do is we refresh everyone ahead of time with what the case is before we read the emails. <laughs> we sometimes don't do that. And sometimes yeah. we don't do that, well, I realize. But we should do that now. I, I, really. Yeah, I think we talked about the fact that, you know, in a perfect world, everybody listens to, to you know, <laughs> and they one after everything. the other and they remember the case and <laughs> right. tune in next week. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was going to, let me, before we read the emails, allow me to remind everybody of our, our case. Good, just refresh our memories. I'm going to refresh your memory. And just very brief, this was a young, uh, I said intelligent, adventurous EIS Trainee, um, but a young, they all? A young EIS officer who returned from a trip to Belize with a skin region, lesion on his rear um, that seemed to enlarge over about a four to five week period, till finally on Super Bowl Sunday there was some definitive event that gave us the diagnosis, and we had a lot of people Is that write in. Deflate bowl uh, Sunday. By <laughs> no, remember we described this was before <laughs> okay. before all, all right. the, the cheating. Okay. Well, the first response to come in was from Christine, <coughs> right. and I suspect that's... Be so I release it on a Saturday, typically. I think this has to do with she that she is in Australia, Brisbane, right. and she said, I think the latest case describes cutaneous furuncular myiasis. Or myiasis. Myiasis? Says, whatever the case may my be. Eye? Myiasis. How would you it's say my it? I'd say myiasis. Myiasis? Yeah. From someone, as, as in, my ISIS has seen the coming of the glory of the, you know, that yeah, sort of You're going to get email. <laughs> I, hope, <laughs> I hope so. I rarely get email. <laughs> it's, well, that's not actually true, but go ahead. I'm waiting for you to hang yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the lesion on the young man's 
Baddock is suggestive of a bot fly infection with the larvae, most likely of the species Dermatobia hominis. The eggs deposited onto a smaller vector fly or mosquito, which lands on the person. The eggs are deposited onto, onto the skin. I think there's a little transposition there. The person in the body cause, heat causes the egg to hatch. The larvae penetrate the skin, often through the mosquito bite or a hair follicle. Six to 12 weeks later, the larvae leave, exiting through their original hole and fall to the ground to pupate. It is this exiting that I expect led to diagnosis on that fateful Sunday. Um, infections most commonly located on exposed skin where flies and mosquitoes often land, but have also occurred on scalp, neck, back, breast, scrotum, tongue, and eye. I have all those tongue. except breast. Well, I guess I have a breast too. Right? Oof. Males have breasts. The condition is self-limiting, but most patients re- prefer its removal prior to its own exit. This is done through killing the larvae, followed by surgical removal. Weather in Brisbane, delightful, <laughs> mostly sunny autumn day with blue skies, a smattering of clouds, 16 to 23 C, 60% chance of any precipitation. You know, it is fall in, in Australia. Indeed. I'm happy that it is now warming up here. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's habitable now, <clears throat> right? We had a rough winter, so it's about time. Yeah, you can read the next one, Dixon. Okay, Robin writes, um, Local treatment of human botfly myiasis in Belize. The human botfly, Dermatobia hominis, is found from Mexico to northern Chile and Argentina. The larvae of this forest-dwelling fly develops in the skin of birds and mammals, including man and women, too. The female <laughs> buttfly captures and lays her eggs on the legs of a dipterin, usually a mosquito, although at least 48 species of dipterins in one tick. A tick are confirmed vectors. I didn't know that ticks could be the vector of this. I, I did know that. That's, that's true. How interesting. <laughs> Upon contact with the host, eggs immediately hatch and larvae penetrate the skin. Pre-existing lesions are not required for entry into the host. The developing maggots form furuncular lesions. That's the second time that term has come up with a central respiratory orifice. That's very technically correct, by the way. A pair of spiracles located on the caudal extremity remain in this orifice, allowing the maggot to breathe. Wow. Transverse rows of epidermal spines anchor the maggot within the muscle. Maggots do not wander and develop to pupate stage the pupil stage requires about six weeks, although infections up to three months have been reported. At maturity, maggots measure up to 25 millimeters long and 7 millimeters in diameter, quite large in other words. Pupae exit the host and pupation is completed in the soil. I need to list a couple of websites here for uh, cutaneous myiasis, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Good stuff. Uh, Should yeah. I comment on what this feruncle people? Yeah, please do that. What, what, what is a feruncle? A feruncle. Feruncular. <clears throat> yes. A feruncle so is uh, next to a ferant. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. So a, a this is great stuff, and you know, when when you study, well, I think it's great stuff. Uh, hopefully, our listeners think it's great stuff. But when you you study the history of medicine, there there were things that, well, w- when you have a limited amount of things that you're focused on and can do, you, you tend to learn a lot and develop a complicated nomenclature. Okay. And uh, skin lesions, basically boils, yeah. um, were, were a major problem um, for humans um, over history. And so there was a lot of um, attention to... Starting with Joe, I presume? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually. I believe he was the first... Uh, Use case the, of a boil in the, history. Primal, <laughs> primal boily. <laughs> so they went ahead and they actually, they, they looked at this, and you would have a very small feruncle. And the idea being is that this is an infection of a single hair follicle mm. or feruncle. When oh. several oh. hair follicles, several feruncles coalesce, it then becomes a carbuncle. Hey, look at Which that. is a slightly larger, and it, it is interesting in, in this. A yeah, carbuncle p- is a large furuncle. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> exactly. right. Exactly. But it's not an yes. auto infection. Yeah. <laughs> See, carbuncle. It's I, got auto- it. I got oh, that, it. Okay. Thank you. Now we're really going to be car <laughs> It's not an right? automobile infection. <laughs> no, it, you could catch it in mobile, but not in your auto. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there is an idea, and maybe Dixon will speak on this mm. if this actually happens to be our diagnosis. But. Do the larvae actually penetrate uh, through and into a hair follicle? Or or do they actually just penetrate and create their own little right. space? So we'll talk about but but the description that people are throwing forward of a 
furuncular lesion is um, actually in the nomenclature of this this particular Pretty suggested good. diagnosis. Pretty good. Pretty good. But yeah, just think of it as a furuncle is small boil, yep. and a carbuncle is a larger boil, which is a coalescence of several yep. smaller furuncles. Yep. Okay. How about that? Uh, your next, uh, Daniel, I think. Peter writes. Peter, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he took took us up on the day twipper. He says, "Greetings, day twippers. Here are my thoughts on the twip eighty nine mystery infectious disease case. Daniel's description of this as a fun case leads me to think that it is an interesting but not a serious or life threatening condition. Yeah. Based on the information given in the program, I would say that the patient has furuncular myiasis caused by Dermatobia hominis, the human bot fly. This parasite is common in Central America." The location of the infection in this case is unusual, as botfly larvae are usually carried by mosquito vectors, and the head and neck are more common sites of infection. The buttocks are not normally that accessible to mosquitoes. Right. And I think uh, I think Dixon had some questions about that yeah, last I did, time. I <laughs> Having did. done further reading on bot flies, <laughs> I see that they also utilize some tick species as vectors. So I think it probable that the EIS trainee received a bite from a tick that was carrying a bot fly larvae, which then parasitized him. And I think, as I sort of mentioned, while Dixon was saying, that is, um, I'll say that one of the little known um, bot fly trivia facts that there are actually ticks mm. that can transmit these. Did you call, did so you call it a fun uh, a story because of furuncular? <laughs> <laughs> was that a hint? Did I throw a hint? Um, maybe it was a hint. But I think also, you know, being a clinician, um, a fun case is right. when no harm comes yeah. to the person. Oh, that's um, right. It's a bit interesting, entertaining, something you'll tell a story about, but not something that really... Um, it's pretty unnerving hurts. to know you have one in your skin, though. I mean, well, when it gets I, large, it's not yeah. small stuff, and you look at your hand Dixon and you is, is speaking wisely when it gets large. Goodness. It's not small. <laughs> no, well, I, I meant to say that it freaks, it freaks some yes. people out to know that there, there is an insect like growing a, in their that tissues. That would be like a Yogi Berraism when it gets yes. large. No, stop it. Stop it. Come on. No, it's not, not small. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's today's title, Dixon. <laughs> there you go. You know, I'm the butt. It's no pun small. intended for this You're case. But oh, you know, everyone's um, joke. I was thinking when he's talking about the, the buttock being unusual, some people wear their pants very low. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, yeah, what an EIS officer York, wouldn't do that. Yeah, I think an EIS would not. But here in New York City, you often see know, people with the butt crack exposed. It's yeah. the style, right? And they're not now, plumbers. Is, no, and they're not plumbers. That's <laughs> right. the style. That's right. It's amazing. That's, that's crazy stuff. Next one's from Rebecca. Hello, Twippers Three. My guess for the case is myiasis caused by a screw worm. Ooh. Is this another name for a? No, it's a different thing. No, it's a totally different thing. The CDC page that discusses myiasis states that the flies may lay eggs on drying clothes that are hung outside, which may have been how this person caught this infection by hanging his swimsuit out to dry. Thanks, as always, for providing me with hours of edutainment as I sift through the piles of culture plates on my otherwise lonely (laughs) weekends at the lab. Oh, dear. So Rebecca is a microbiology section head at a hospital in Hastings, Michigan. It is not lonely. You have your bacteria with you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. D- Dixon. Another one. Okay. Uh, S.J. writes, Hello, professors, with two Fs. <clears throat> First email. Thanks for the Twix series of podcasts. I've been enjoying them since the start of the Ebola outbreak when someone suggested hmm. Twiv to me on Facebook. Oh, that's nice. It's 21 degrees C, windy with possible thunder showers forming out here in the eastern Sierra of California. I'm a lab assistant at our local hospital, looking to go back to school to become a lab tech sometime in the near future. Unfortunately, we send out our parasitology testing with the exception of a rapid Giardia slash Cryptosporidium test, so I haven't gotten to see any eukaryotic parasites in person. That's terrible, isn't it? It is. It's such a a loss of uh, experience, as it were. Anyhow... Uh, is it Dermatomia hominis? There, there are bot flies in Belize. The symptoms match. The only thing that doesn't quite work is the larvae should have waited about three more weeks before <laughs> dropping out. But perhaps the patient noticed other signs that the larvae were present. That the larvae was present. No larvae were. That's all I could come up with. No super happy. Not super happy with the location of the bite, given the fact that he stayed in a screened room. <laughs> Anyhow, keep up the good work. Looking forward to hearing the answer to this puzzle. Mm. Right. Good yeah. thinkers. Good. Uh, good guesses. 
Good Daniel. Elise writes, Dear Twip Collective. I, hope, huh. I feel like the Borg. I hope this finds you all well. It is very warm and sticky here in lower Manhattan, about 25 degrees C, but humidity is 65% having the effect of making everyone cranky, except me, because I'm working on your new puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going again to hazard a guest diagnosis, this time for your Super Bowl watching Belize Traveler, and I hope my guest can also satisfy the answer to the question, what happened as, we, as he was watching the big game? <laughs> it sounds as if the EIS trainee patient has dermatobia hominis cutaneous myiasis. I believe he may be hosting botfly larvae. Mm -hmm. The botfly, Dermatobia hominis, is found in Central and South America, generally Belize specifically. Its eggs usually get transmitted to non-human mammals, which is why the symptoms of this infestation are often misinterpreted or misunderstood as something being like an infected cyst or boil, leishmaniasis or cellulitis. Typically, mosquitoes inadvertently deposit the botfly on a mammalian host when feeding. This is fascinating because the mosquito is carrying around <laughs> eggs that only hatch when they sense the warmth of the mammalian body. This transmission can also happen by the mosquito, also inadvertently, leaving eggs on clothing that has been hung out to dry, as the patient's likely non-speedo-type bathing suit was. <laughs> For this reason, an account I found in the UK Daily Mail publication advised that travelers iron the clothing they have left out to dry. Uh, this seems like well-meaning, but pretty impractical advice at best, given the circumstances <laughs> under which most people are traveling in these locales. Mm. Who would uh, iron their swimsuit anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some other things that they should be watching for. Uh, there are some other flies. The uh, mango fly, for instance, would lay its eggs on soil diapers, for instance, and uh, you can get a myiasis condition from that as well, which is mm. not related to this one, but it's it's really a nasty cutaneous infest infestation, as they would call it. The patient's symptom, a bump that gradually grew and developed a small central hole or impression, that seemed almost like a boil or a pimple are consistent with what happens when one is hosting botfly larvae. The indentation in the center of the bump is the spot where the larvae's spiracles are enabling it to breathe. There is not usually excessive pain for the host, but I did find accounts of itching and occasional sharp pains when the larvae moves around. The patient didn't describe either of these symptoms, but perhaps that is because of where he was hosting the botfly larva. Some of the accounts I read involve the eggs taking up residence on the scalp or beside patients' ears, or even in their eyes. May I interject something here, yes, please? Yes, And that is that uh, I, I noticed that several of our listeners wrote in using the term larvae when they really meant larva. It's one. It's one. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually usually just one that, that occupies a single spot. I like your attention to grammar, Dixon. You're welcome. You could be the grammar guy. I don't think so. Ask my wife. She's correcting me all the time. She's the on grammar stuff. girl. She is the ultimate source for editing, oh, I, okay. I would say. All right. At least in my house. So those <laughs> may be much more sensitive areas. The other thing that leads me to suspect cutaneous myiasis is your collective secretness about what happened <laughs> to the patient during the Super Bowl after he had been incubating the larvae for five to six weeks. Right. Did he give birth to a third stage botfly larva? According to accounts I have read, if the larvae isn't removed, after four to ten weeks, the larvae needs to fall away from its mammalian host and finish developing underground. If this event wasn't so dramatic, perhaps the patient just felt the larvae moving, which is probably pretty freaky, and went to an ER or a right. clinic. It is interesting that so many of the sources I found recommended home remedies for removing the botfly larva by covering the bump, especially the spiracles, with Vaseline right. yeah, or nail right. polish right. or anything else that would prevent the larvae from breathing. Exactly. And then extracting it as it moves to the mm. surface in an effort to breathe. Here, here. Removing that larvae <clears throat> is the cure for the infestation. And there are no accounts of lasting side effects. Right. Would it be wise for the patient to take some sort of antibiotic after getting rid of the larvae? Often I want to discuss my amateur parasite sleuthing with the people around me, but I must say that in this case I restrained myself because it's a little too gross for my audience, but uh -huh. not for me. Oh, good. As always, thank you so much for your wonderful podcast. It is great fun. Best. Cool. James writes, Dear TWIP team, I think I finally have a reasonable guest, TWIP89. I'm a graduate student in analytical chemistry, so I don't know much about oh. parasites, though I'm slowly learning. Though out of my field, I find the TWIV, TWIM, TWIP, and Urban Ag enriching listening while I perform experiments in the lab. Keep up the good work. Now on to the guests. 
I think that was ailing the young EIS trainee was Botfly. When I was a junior in high school, we took a trip to Belize and heard oh. all about the Botfly. Even got to see an active case of it. Nice. One of the guides on the trip had a large bump on the back of his neck. He convinced a second guy to cut open his large red bump with a sterilized, quote unquote, <laughs> reed rinsed with vodka <laughs> <laughs> pocket knife. The second guy then took a can of Raid Roach Killer oh my and sprayed it onto oh. the wound. Oh my gosh. The whole procedure looked quite painful, but the two acted in a way that made me think this wasn't the first time. Do not done. try this at home. <laughs> Hopefully this guess isn't too far off the mark, but the bot flight ordeal makes for a good story, even if I am wildly incorrect. I almost forgot the weather here in central Illinois is rain with a high of 51F, 10.5C. Quite chilly for springtime, but it will be warming up this weekend. I don't know about raid, man. I think that's not the recommended therapy. I, I'm not sure that you want <laughs> to spray level. raid into a human wound. No, but you can just hear that lava actually, going, let me just raid. say, I'm sure you don't want to spray you to raid into a human no, wound. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. That's just too toxic for words. You're next, Dixon. I am. Carol writes, greetings, Team Twip. My guest for this episode, case study, is cutaneous larval migrans or creeping eruption. Hmm. Whether I'm correct or not, it sounds unpleasant. The more parasites I learn about, the less I want to leave my house. <laughs> At least treatment for many parasites is relatively easy in case reasonable precautions fail. I look forward to the next episode, Carol. Well, uh, I just wanted to add something here. I don't want to start off correcting everybody's diagnosis, but if it was creeping eruption, it would have left a trail of itching behind it, whereas this thing stayed mm -hmm. absolutely still. So... It's not creeping. It could be a larval infection, but the word cutaneous larval migrans, the word migrans indicates that it, it actually moves. So um, it wouldn't fit the diagnosis in this case. But All that right. was a good guess. Maybe we'll cover one of those some other time. Okay. Heather writes, I like Heather's short to the point of email. <laughs> I finally have time to make a guess on the case. The young man has a butt fly. <laughs> I like that. Oh, I good. Mean, I mean a butt fly, otherwise right. known as a warble. Indeed, that is a, that's another word for it. Uh, I bet I could read the next one. You can. Joseph writes, Dermatobia hominis. Very good. Grace writes, Dear Day Twippers, Grace and Kaylee here again. We write to you from the parking lot of the closest <laughs> pizza parlor with free Wi-Fi after getting rained out from a day of squirrel trapping. We guess the young man who traveled to Belize and returned with a red bump was bitten by a mosquito or other biting insect carrying the eggs of the human botfly, Dermatobia hominis. If we are right, then we extend our sympathy for the poor man's right buttock. <laughs> <laughs> we occasionally run across chipmunks and deer mice harboring botfly right. larvae That's and don't right. en envy them the experience. I yeah. hope your case subjects team won the Super Bowl, however. A, larvae, a larval botfly emergence probably made for an exciting halftime show. <laughs> Wishing you sunshine and squirrels, Grace and Kaylee. Almost as exciting as Janet Jackson's. <laughs> Alan writes, Aloha, doctors. The weather in Kona today is a pleasant 77 Fahrenheit, 25 oh, Celsius, yeah. partially cloudy. Sure. With VOG, volcanic fog. Ah, so thick goodness. I cannot see the horizon, although it's there somewhere. I never heard that one before. My How cool. Goodness. Wow. That I like cool. your new podcast format. But as you're now turning podcasts out weekly, <laughs> by the time I finish listening to an episode in the car and I'm ready to take a stab at the case study, a new episode arrives. But don't slow down. <laughs> right. Oh, we get the next guy. Fun case study it's this week. The same, oh, this is the same one. Same guy. Yeah, he goes yeah, on. Sure. Yeah. I got to spend. So when you throw in the bolt, it throws me. Yeah. Just, okay, <laughs> I got to spend two full years between 1984 and 1990 living and working in Belize and Guatemala, helping start community health training programs, volunteering in the outpatient clinic at the National Hospital in Belpapan, and working in the refugee camps that were scattered at that time around the capital. On hearing this week's case, I immediately suspected the patient had a simple botfly larva myiasis, most likely from Dermatobia hominid. Although I have seen a few non-typical myiasis over the years in Belize and Guatemala as well, where the larva would develop in a tight spiral just under the skin, oh which is not typical of my experiences with the human botfly larva. Right. My guess is that there were that these were probably from other Dermatobia species, but I never followed up. Perhaps I can dig up an old photo for you to identify. My guess is that on Super Bowl Sunday, the small larval <laughs> breathing hole opened up on your patient's lesion, or perhaps the larvae actually emerged at that point. 
We always used to treat by covering the breathing hole with Vaseline, and if the larva was small enough, it would emerge on its own far enough to grab with forceps and remove. Larger botfly larvae needed to have a small incision made to fully remove intact. In Guatemala or Belize, Belize, this could be done in 20 minutes by a minimally trained community-based healthcare worker. Take a botfly larva back to the States, and the treatment can become a circus with consultations true. from four medical specialties. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How true. While a botfly <laughs> by Iasis fits the symptoms described, I would want to rule out a primary stage onchocerciasis nodule. Uh -huh. However, onchocerciasis, onchocerciasis in Central America is just in the Sierra Madres, where there is highly oxygenated falling water. In Belize, you would only see it in refugees, but back in the day, the thought was <laughs> you could control river blindness by popping out the subcutaneous primary stage nodules before they matured. We didn't realize how many hid out in the deep tissue. Right. I don't know if botfly larvae would find albendazole or ivermectin disagreeable, as I never needed to treat it systematically. systemically. In reviewing the modern botfly literature today, I learned for the first time of the botfly's use of transitional vectors, such as houseflies and mosquitoes, to deliver botfly larvae to their hosts like guided missiles. Yep. This would help explain the nodule's location on a less accessible area. Nor had I realized that the Inuit people apparently consider the larvae quite tasty, hmm. perhaps an acquired taste. Right. <laughs> Very accord. Weight of the groan. <laughs> I always enjoy your perspectives and interaction. And he goes on regarding oh, yes. your discussion on water purification. I have a little experience teaching and using solar disinfection. Oh, I have a little experience teaching and using solar disinfection. About 30 years. The first research I ever saw on solar disinfection came out in 1979 from the American University in Beirut. Later confirmed repeatedly by WHO Geneva, Ireland's Royal College, Texas A&M, and many others. Because no one believes it. Solar disinfection has its place for some situations. In refugee situa situations, after the media money, intense spotlight disappears and oh. donated reverse osmosis filter breaks down. Hmm. And before real health security development conditions are reestablished. Solar disinfection on non-turbid water in two liter pet containers left in intense sunlight for some five hours seems to really kill the diarrheal disease causing bacterial and viral organisms. While solar heating of the water from 30 to 50 degrees Celsius makes this process more efficient, three times more at 50 degrees. The heating is not the essential element. Highly oxygenating the water by shaking for 20 seconds probably helps as much. Hmm. I've used it with our teams for up to three months, and while it works, it is inconvenient. If I can afford $18 Sawyer 0.1 micron microtubule filter with no moving parts to break and a 1 million gallon warranty, I now typically use that. Or their $80 um, 0.01 micron viral filter both using basically kidney dialysis tubules. Hmm. We were a part of the wide-scale testing of this filter in 70,000 families after wow. the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Wow. And it's now what most through hikers on the AT or PCT trails carry. Great. Always value your thoughts and experience. Vince, are you aware if solar disinfection has been tested against polio virus? Dixon, whether or not the glacial ice is contaminated, I'm with you in guessing that as ice cubes in a right. glass of scotch, the organisms don't stand much of a chance. Best regards and keep the great keep right. up the great work, Alan. So just for clarity's sake, the AT stands for the Appalachian Trail and the PCT stands for the Pacific Coast Trail. Yep. Wow. For hikers. What an outdoors guy you are. Uh, yeah, I'm an outdoor huh. guy. Wow, it's impressive. Well, why do you know this stuff? Well, because I'm an outdoor guy. You like That's hiking? Uh, I don't like hiking up mountains and stuff. I like hiking along rivers. Okay. Uh, yes, it's been tested against polio, and it works very well. It doesn't activate polio uh -huh. rapid, rather rapidly. All right. What about you, Dixon? What about me? <sighs> I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Should I read the next one? Is Dixon, whether or not the glacial ice is contained. Oh, yeah, no, no. I think that's, uh, you know, I said it first. So, I mean, I, was, I wouldn't care, basically. Yeah, you're right, um, you're right. I actually would care, but. All right. Dan writes, 
Jan, I guess, our friend in Rotterdam. Yeah. So, hi, guys. Since you started calling me a friend, I suppose I can be a bit more informal. <laughs> I didn't have time to change jobs to look up the most likely species, but my guess would be an insect which deposited an egg in the poor man's posterior. Why did you find out during watching a game? Must have been the bouncing on the couch and the agitated moving sports fans exhibit when watching something completely inconsequential. <laughs> yes, Jan, exactly. See, Vincent agrees with you, Jan. I but, totally you know. agree with you. I know that much of the world... You know, Dixon... People get united around certain things, and one of them is sports. My guess is Jan is a big sports fan for speed skating <laughs> and soccer. Uh, well, he probably thinks that's consequential, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Especially during the Olympics. P.S. The weather in Rotterdam is 15C with light overcast. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Daniel, I think you should read this should next I, one. Should I read this next <laughs> one? Eloise writes, Dear Twippers, I totally deserve an award. <laughs> <laughs> I am a 12-year-old girl who wants to be a writer, and I listen to TWIP. <laughs> of course, I must admit, I did not start of my own volition. My father, a humble scientist, <laughs> wrote a letter and appeared on the show and did not mention me. Oh, no. This letter is a reminder, Father, that you better start mentioning me. <laughs> I should point out Eloise is my middle daughter. <laughs> anyway, in your last episode, I found the case very interesting, and I am dying to know what happened on Super Bowl Sunday. My guess for the case is pilot idol cyst, but it's probably not because that's not a parasitism. Right. My sister Daisy, that's my 14-year-old, uh, yeah, yeah. swears, oh, sorry, she's yelling at me, <laughs> that she thinks that, not swears it, that it's botfly larva. And my friend Daisy. Cricket who I forced to listen to the show, says she thinks it's a leech bite. Oh. I have never been right on a case before, but I thought you might want to hear from a fangirl of Twip. <laughs> With all due respect and annoyance at my sister, Eloise Clemens Griffin the First. My goodness gracious. How eloquently written, by the way. Yes. That's yes. great. She wants to be a writer. She actually is a very good writer. She She's won a couple poetry awards. No kidding. Yes, so she's... Quite Maybe she could write a poem about butt flies. I, we should suggest that. <laughs> Eloise, write a Maybe poem a haiku, about parasites. A haiku butt fly poem would be great. And uh, maybe I should read the next one, because yeah. this is from Daisy. This yeah. is from the 14 year old Which came in a little bit afterwards. Okay. <laughs> so maybe she, she cheated off Eloise. We'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy writes, I think that the guy in the last episode had a botfly larva buried in his skin. Wow. This insect lays its eggs on a mosquito, tick, or fly, and the eggs hatch when the vector feeds on a host. The lesion seems like the bump that would be made by a botfly larva, which would be raised, painful, and have redness around it, usually mistaken for a mosquito bite. This will swell as the larva grows, which would be why the bump got bigger. The central part of the lesion could be the hole in the skin the maggot creates so that it can breathe. If left untreated, the larvae will mature and emerge in five to ten weeks, which is consistent with the time between his trip to Belize and Super Bowl Sunday. The human botfly is also found in Central and South America, which is also consistent with this case. Getting a botfly on a visit to those areas is rare, but cases are increasing as tourism <laughs> increases to those areas. If the man has discovered what his bump was before Super Bowl Sunday, he could have done something to cut off the larva's air supply and kill it. Lordy, what yes, do you teach these kids at home, <laughs> got, Daniel? Not they're only, missing their childhood. <laughs> she got the, the plurality correct. She's saying she so did, did Alan, but she got it also larva. This is amazing, just absolutely stunning. Yeah, well, more. if they're if they're right. <laughs> oh, oh, right, sure, if they're right. Don't do that, don't do that. Yes, no, this is what I have to live with. Uh, the, uh, that's last, incredible. The last one is from Bill, who writes about this question that someone had on the last episode have, having to do with body fat, which none of us could answer. Remember that, Dixon? Do you remember? No, you don't remember, because you don't think of anything. I do you're, remember you're that, because they it. store the fat in their hump. No, no, this was about, well. I remember it. It was yes. about people and fat and resistance to infection. Anyway, oh, okay. Vincent Dixon, I recall that humans on have one aspect that resembles camels. In certain <laughs> tropical areas, they both store fat against leaner times. In women, this is called steatopagy, a.k.a. steatopagia. Do you pronounce the P as hard? Steatopagia? Steatopagia. Yeah. And it seems to have become part of the beauty ratings of African women as manifest huh. in booty worship. Speaking of booty... 
That's what we're talking about in the Botfly, right? Indeed. A certain KK being renowned in that aspect, <coughs> and I guess KK is Kim Kardashian, right? <laughs> Logically, a beauty aspect is a proxy for a survival <coughs> attribute. Me. Women with stored fat will live on, on while their fashion model stars, equals seen as more beautiful, will starve in droves. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if some camels are also seen to be more attractive for similar reasons. As for the hapless student in Belize, I wonder if his growing red nodule has a breathing hole, which might indicate uh -huh. a possible dermatobia hominis infestation carried to him by Bingo. some intermediate host. All right, that does it. Was this that, was brilliant. Was what a spread of uh, opinions. It's wonderful. I and like, age groups also. I like the really engagement. Right. I like the engagement. Absolutely. No, no, only if you were engaged. No, no. I, I, Are you engaged? <laughs> I used to be, and now I'm sol solidly ensconced. You are so corny. I know. That's that's my nature. That I is my nature. corniness was outlawed. Um, not on this show. <laughs> Boy, if it was. All right, Daniel. The show, what, uh, the show would be over. What do we need to know? Well, we I think everybody is very excited to hear what, what happened. happened. We, what we were so secretive about. What, Especially. What happened. Daisy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this gentleman reports that he felt an odd sensation in his buttock area, like something was moving. Um, he His team was losing, which we mentioned. I think that's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was diverted in his attentions away from the game. Now, he excused himself from the party and went to the bathroom to see what was happening. And he was able to exert pressure on the sides of the lesion. This, whatever it was, was starting to emerge. Lordy. And the combination of it starting to emerge and the pressure, out came this cylindrical object with small Bingo. black specks on the surface. Love it. And as we mentioned, he's an EIS officer. He's down at, so he takes this to some friends of his <laughs> and says, look what came out. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? The pick of the week, so to speak. <laughs> what came out of my butt. Jeez. Yes. What came out? Oh, my gosh. It's, oh, it's, a different, it's a different breed, right? It totally you know? is. I mean, this, totally, this is what I would totally. do. I would bring this to work. Check this out. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> You got it right. Dixon, if you said, look what came out of my butt, I was get out of here. <laughs> if you heard that from a parasitologist, you'd have to t pause a moment to say, was it alive or not? <laughs> so his friends identified it for him? They did. They did. And, and uh, I, I brought a representative little picture. Uh, but it, and it, is, it was a bot fly larva, a single bot fly larva. Right. And it actually, it was moving. The thing was emerging. Mm, still alive. What would and happen so, after the larva emerges? Well, pupate. Uh, as, yeah, as our as our, some pupate. of our emailers sent in, it needs to then fall into the soil, and it needs a period of time in the lower soil to That's right. pupate. Yes, indeed. Um, of course, in the city, it's not going to fall in any soil. Uh, right? Central Park, you can. No, but if you're in, in your Park. apartment, it's going to fall on the floor, and it's <laughs> the <end> potted <laughs> plant next to you. <laughs> potted plant. <laughs> yes, if it happens to fall into a pot. Depends on what you're growing at I home. I don't know if the potted plant would be deep enough. Like if it would actually be able to undergo mm. a successful pupation in yeah, a potted that plant. Would depend. And with urban yeah. agriculture on the rise. Who knows what's possible over the next? So, how was years. it delivered to this gentleman? Do you think? Well, that that was, I think, you know, I, I actually have several of these sort of stored away in my mind, and even written up a little which ones to present. And that was one of you know, there's a couple of curious aspects of this case that made it one that I wanted to present. One, it was an EIS officer, right? You know, we all have a little bit of, you know, hero worship for those out there on, you know, the front lines have gone That's through right, that they're training. In the trenches, as it were, and. Uh, the other was it's an odd location because this brings this brings up a distinction between the types of myiasis that will occur in Africa, for instance, and the types of myiasis that will occur in Belize and we'll say Central right. and South America. Right. And I could see that Dixon was getting all sort of you know uh, hot and bothered about this last time, but well, it was it was not a good so hot, but <laughs> <laughs> certainly bothered. <laughs> so he was bothered, but not hot, cold that's and bothered. Right. That's right. The the uh. bot fly. That we tend to see in Central America has this, I don't know, wonderful, horrible, startling <laughs> um, life cycle aspect where it will, it will actually grab another insect, pin the thing down, yeah, yeah. lay its eggs on its underbelly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, you can probably get some movies of this on YouTube or something, <laughs> pinning them down. It lays up to 30 eggs on the underside of 30. You know, let's say mosquitoes. And the yeah, interesting thing yeah. that Daisy Girl seemed to know about ticks. Um, which may have played a part in our case. Uh, and then, so they're not actually biting you, but you are being bit by an insect. And when the insect right. is on you biting, the warmth, as some people mentioned, um, 
triggers the, the next stage of the process and the, the basically the infestation, the um, invasion. And then over four to five or five to 10 weeks, depending, it undergoes this whole development under the skin. Now, this is a little bit different than what goes on in Africa. In Africa, um, <laughs> and you brought this up, the whole ironing your clothes, you know, and, and I was in, what was I in Africa? A little over a year ago. And, and you know, like everyone, I'm like, oh, these, I'll just hang these on the line. Mm-hmm. No, you will not hang those on the line. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, you know, and there was some, we were staying with my, um, sister or brother-in-law and their yeah. their kids they've yeah. got three kids i've mentioned their three kids they haven't been left out and uh they had um two women working for them and uh they were all the clothes needed to be put in a hot dryer or iron because Correct. if you hang them on the line um in that case it's going to be a different um different myiasis yeah. it will the eggs will get laid on your clothes mm. um particularly the clothes when they're moist the, and then when you put the clothes on then you'll end up, usually in that case, you'll end up with multiple of these furuncular myiasis That's right. That's um, right. cases. So so I thought that was interesting that this this brings up that whole issue about there's a slightly different dynamic, a slightly different larvae in Central South America that we have in Africa. So when you think about, uh, to follow up again uh, on another level, uh, of the groups of insects that can invade mm-hmm. your skin, there's one called the... Uh, the uh, it's called tunga penetrans. It's a flea. It's a parasitic flea. And as an adult organism, it actually lives embedded in your foot, in the subcutaneous tissues. And it's, it's spherical, of course, points out so that it can breathe. Tunga penetrans is a devastating infestation in some places. And it was brought from South America to Africa by the slave ships, which had dropped off their slaves in South America, but in order to get back, they had to take back an equal weight of material, so they brought back sand. And the sand contained the larvae <laughs> of the <laughs> tug of penetrans, wow. and they brought it back to Africa. So that was a case of reverse osmosis wow. of parasitic infections going from the wrong direction, basically. And then from that point on, it became a, a double continental infection. It's an interesting life cycle. Very interesting. I like Very this idea of them putting breathing holes through the skin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> This is so crazy. And to see uh, animals like rabbits, for instance, they get in, infested with it. When I say infested, I don't mean infected, right? Because an, an infection is something that multiplies. This doesn't multiply. Once it's there, you get one, that's the end. Right. The, the See the back of a rabbit totally invaded by these lar- large, big, large flies. It just It's disgusting. You could probably have multiple. You can. Now, why don't we generate an immune response that will destroy the larva? That's a great question. Or why isn't it infected secondarily with bacteria and stuff like this, too? And we think the answer might lie in the fact that it may secrete something that prevents Mm. infection. So that maybe this is a good source to look towards for the next uh, kind of antibiotic therapy that you might be looking for. So it for. may be immunodistracting, right, Dixon? Uh, I don't you, think I said you, that. You <laughs> said that word. I <laughs> said no diversion. <laughs> diversion. Diversion. Yeah, but not, that's not something different. I didn't mean to say that for this one. I think in it this case, I don't think be. it's immunosuppressive. Yeah. I think that it's um, it lives in a spot in the skin which is not involved in the immune system. I think well, it doesn't go deep Well, the skin is very enough. good. Yeah, this doesn't go deep. It, it, it looks like it goes deep, but there's no bleeding. There's no um, induration, basically. Actually, this is interesting. This brings up, um, you know, so you, you get one of these and you think, oh my gosh. And as we mentioned, this guy kept trying to pop this thing. Mm. Right. Let's say he was a little more aggressive. Yeah. And it's three weeks in and he's like, you know, this thing. And he really squeezes. He squeezes mm. enough to actually kill the larvae. Yeah. That's- not good. A couple things can happen. Um, one is you can actually end up with a horrible super infection. Second, uh, and I was trying to find some actual case reports of this, but my understanding there has been some anaphylactic uh, mm-hmm. reactions. Yeah, right. um, so there, there definitely is some sort of um, setup here, and whether it's that there's a physical barrier between, or maybe immunosuppressive, you know, or whether there's any by sort the of larva yeah. itself. That's true. Yeah, it wouldn't be unheard of. Happens yeah. in other uh, parasitic infections. When you kill the parasite, then you no longer suppress. And yeah, yeah. Cystocercosis is a good example of that. But when they start to die, that's when the patients yeah. start exhibiting symptoms. Mm. 
You know, or as we went to get coffee, we were discussing Dracunculus Meninensis. Yes, we were. The, uh... <laughs> we often do that, by the way, on the way to coffee. <laughs> to lunch, no, we would never discuss yeah. that. <laughs> no, that was actually the, the poor summer student. Uh, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Well, you know, never go out to dinner with a parasitology couple, because if you do that, the the table talk will just uh, it'll vacate the place. Well, as you saw with my children, you can you can see what we we do around my house. <laughs> that's not a bad deal. That, that's great. I, I, the table talk must be incredible at your yes, place. Yes, my wife does not like to be part of, it, but the kids, the kids actually love it. I yeah, mean, they do. This they stuff do. is cool. It is. It is very cool. Um, but yeah, as you're talking about sort of all, all sort of the three major, we'll call them these ectoparasites of yeah. the skin. Yeah. Um, you've got the tunga or tungiasis. That's the flea, which is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, you've got this, which is the bot fly, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the tumbu fly, which that's is sort of your mango, classic, mango, the mango or that's, your African. That's exactly so. right. But many others around the world too, you know, mostly they're zoonoses, but occasionally we get in the way of these things and uh, we'll do in a pinch sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The thing is that I was going to talk about the tick for a moment because in order to pick up a tick, you usually brush up against them as you're walking, mm -hmm. let's say, through tall grass or something like this. On a beach, I don't think of ticks as beach animals. And mm -hmm. let's say if it was accidentally put there by wind or something else, a tick, when it gets on your body, does a lot of crawling before it settles down to a place where it's going to start taking a blood meal. And that would have allow the eggs to hatch along the root of this traveling tick. Mm -hmm. I don't think it starts out at the buttock. I think it starts out on your ankle or something. And along the way, those eggs should have hatched and dropped off way before the tick got to the buttock. Yeah, because they're on a warm surface. Yeah, on a warm because I don't surface, think it's... The so trigger, therefore, I don't the think trigger. it's a tick that the that, that, uh, EIS officer encountered. It was probably an, an errant... Let's say it could have even been one of these little noceums, right? Mm -hmm. Little sand flies. On the beaches, you find lots of those little sand flies. And you wouldn't have seen those. Ever. <laughs> and they can go anywhere, basically. They can, and they're, they have these little stinging bites that they don't, they don't sting until the, the little sand fly is gone. And then you go to slap. Of course, you're not slapping the, the fly anymore. You're just, just scratching that uh, mm -hmm. bite. So, yeah, a lot of interesting anecdotal stories about this stuff. Yeah, and the, treat, the treatment came up a few times. And uh, the Vaseline is actually a great way to yeah, do it. Yeah, Just put some non- and People right. like to put bacon on this. You know, if people bacon? put steaks on like black eyes. I, I never, but I think what it is is yeah. that bacon is bacon. so fatty that oh, it's a readily I excessive, see. occlusive um, dressing yeah, um, yeah, substance. Yeah, yeah. The thing you don't want to do is um, in some areas they've actually put like a scotch tape, right? You know, some people uh, like to put duct tape or scotch tape. And the reason you don't want to do that is that potentially when you peel off that tape, um, you can rip off part of the spicules. Exactly. So what you want is you want some sort of a substance that the larvae, who is yeah. now asphyxiating, yeah. um, can migrate through. The sure. tape will actually both block them and potentially rip off the spicules. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Vaseline is... So, is I'm going to recommend Vaseline. Here's... An interesting side note, too, because prior to the era of antibiotics, we had very little choices with regards to treating open wounds. So during the Civil War, it became a common practice to allow certain kinds of flies to lay their eggs on the, on the rotting pieces of tissue surrounding a festering wound. Let's say you're wounded with a mini ball or something like this and or a sword <clears throat> and it started to become gangrenous uh the fly larvae the maggots would actually eat the dead tissue only there are some fly larvae that only eat dead tissue and they could debreed the wound using maggots mm. and the area would remain sterile so this indicates as well to me that there might be some substances that these organisms produce to keep down the competition so that they can have access to the meal themselves rather than sharing it with microbes right so they they would secrete these substances at the same time there are others however if you don't know how to identify those flies very well that will eat the dead tissue and then they'll start eating the live tissue <laughs> so mm -hmm. you can get into trouble really fast if you don't know the difference but they use those as medical treatments for yeah, I, treating yeah. gangrenous wounds that, and the patients would recover 
Yes, you can order these. <laughs> there now. Are, there are maggot yes. supply places yes. where you can get these medically approved maggots. And we used to think that they were really good at not eating live tissue. Yeah, they're well. pretty good. So you want to pay attention because they're, they're not going to – they'll get pretty good at the breeding, and then it's time to remove them. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah. let them just keep going. They'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll keep eating. So if – if we can harken back to my textbook, uh, obviously I didn't just write that textbook myself. Bob Guads, who was a guest on our show early on in this series, uh, wrote the section on medical entomology. And <laughs> he had a lot of really gross pictures of myiasis victims uh, in which uh, I remember one in particular was a homeless gentleman who uh, had a cancerous growth between the septa of his nose. And if you looked up into one of his nostrils, it was just packed with maggots. Yeah, I remember that picture. Eating yeah. the dead tissue yes. and saving this guy's life, maybe, maybe who knows. But uh, at any rate, we've, there's a lot of uh, variation on this one. So it was a great case to, to start discussions like that. All right. <laughs> I liked it. Oh, no, no. So uh, I can remember as a graduate student here at Columbia's um, School of Public Health, I took a course with Dr. Roger Williams, who was our medical entomologist, and Part of the quiz that we got from the part on, on uh, diptera were uh, a series of spherical morphologies, and we had to match up the spiracles with the actual species of the flies that, that uh, contain those spiracles. It was quite, quite a detailed journey through medical entomology. I, but, uh, a diptera is a fly, right? Yeah, two wings. It just means two wings. That's the diptera. Uh, and coleoptera? Coleoptera beetles. So uh, on TWIV last week, we were doing a paper where they rolled off a bunch of genera. <laughs> right. And Kathy and I said, too bad Dixon isn't here. We <laughs> well, got diptera. We didn't get coleoptera. There are 20-some-odd orders of insects. What was the 20 other? 20-some-odd. Uh, let me, let me see what the other I could go through most of them because I had to know those for my uh, my preliminary examination when I got my PhD at Notre Dame. I actually I, had to know those genera, those I, odors. I thought it was for fly fishing. I thought you learned all yeah. this to improve your fly fishing. You no, know, there are only a few aquatic <laughs> ent entomological um, uh, groups that you had to keep track of there, uh, stoneflies, caddisflies, and uh, mayflies. But And there are some diptera that breed in water too, but mostly, uh, yeah, le they're... Lepidoptera, which are butterflies. Those are butterflies, mm -hmm. right? There was another one I can't remember. That's okay. Uh, there's... Orthoptera, those are the grasshoppers and crickets. And then there's Ephemeroptera, those are the mayflies, because they don't live very long. These That's are why they're actually, named. Um, uh, it, okay, here you go, Hymenoptera. Hymenoptera, those are the uh, wasps. Wasps. And bees. Yeah, okay. Right, and ants, those fall into that category too, because they sting, hmm. just like the bees. This is an interesting, so this protein is a neuron-specific protein uh, okay. in mosquitoes. Which are, which are diptera, right? They are. Uh, diptera, coleoptera, hymenoptera, lepidoptera. And this protein yes. protects the brain from lethal virus infection. Oh, interesting. The brain. Well, there are many brains in an insect, by the way. A mosquito brain. No, there are many brains in an insect. <laughs> Where? Many. They have, an they have a subesophageal ganglion, and they have supraesophageal right. ganglia. In the paper, it said the mosquito brain. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, it's in parts <laughs> rather than a single unit. It's a very, it protects mosquitoes That's from very lethal dengue. It does not eliminate because there's low okay. level of virus so they can transmit it. Got it. But it makes them live long enough so that they can <sighs> transmit and this protein binds the virus particle and prevents it oh, from wow. being taken into the cell. Is that part of an innate immune system for the insects? Probably. Wow. These proteins, cool. and uh, they have a domain, which is called a sushi domain, <laughs> or complement control protein domain. Uh -huh. So I called the episode Coyotes Have Sushi. Oh, that's cool. Because that's Coyotes cool. is the name of the really sorry school I missed it. Sorry that I, missed I went it. to. That's okay, Dixon. You weren't invited anyway. <laughs> this is true. This is all true. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't mean to insult I you. I think entomology is a great science. And by the way, where did you go to school for your... Yeah, Thomas Eisner was at Cornell. Yeah, well, the subject right? of entomology... Thomas Eisner, yes. is that his name? Yes, he was the chemical uh, ecologist up there. But Yeah. But... The subject of entomology was invented at Cornell. Really? No kidding. So all of what we know now about entomology started up there because I guess you were part of a land grad school that also had an ag school associated yeah, with it. Yeah, there was an agriculture school. And as a result, the insects have their way with our crops. They eat half of what we grow. 
which is why I'm so interested in urban agriculture well, and, because and we can keep them indoor out. Indoor farms, way. you can keep them out, right? Exactly right. So you can prevent half of the loss of food just by growing inside. Unless someone brings one in in their butt and deposits it. <laughs> <laughs> this yes. is all true. Yes. But then there are pest control measures using other insects like ladybugs to eat aphids and that sort of thing. So that you have, you can set up an ecology that favors indoor growing very nicely without having the whole schmear in there. All right. Yep. Let's do a paper. Well, you got you know, it. we didn't do one last time. We did not. But this is an interesting one. It is. Which was published in Science. Yeah. It's all about malaria. It is it called is. a forward genetic screen. Identifies erythrocyte CD55 as essential for plasmodium falciparum invasion. Right. First author is Elizabeth Egan, and the last author is Manoy Dura Singh. And there Dura are many Singh. authors in between them. <laughs> many, and they're at Harvard many. School of Public Health, a variety of other places, uh, University of South Florida. The Broad Institute. That's a good place. Now, this is a very interesting paper. It's all about um, invasion of erythrocytes, which is right. where malaria likes to go, right, Dixon? They only go there. <laughs> well, actually, they go in two different places. In the liver, right? That's right. And they go into, into after they come out of the liver, then they go yeah. into red blood cells. They do, they do. The problem with erythrocytes is that they don't have nuclei. Oh, in mammals, they don't. In That's mammals. True. In chickens, they do. That's right. Uh, what else? I think avian species and reptiles. So also. dinosaurs reptiles. probably had nucleated oh, yeah. red blood cells. That's right. Yep. That exactly. was an, that was another discussion we had a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Saul was in on that one. Saul, right. what do you think? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, we, we, de we decided they had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we think they had nuclei. That's right. But so there there are a number of polymorphisms in human populations which are thought to affect entry, but you can't right. ever test them because you can't ah, do genetics on erythrocytes. Right. Until, so well, then what? Until this. Uh -huh. Paper, because apparently now uh -huh. you can take uh, precursor cells, stem cells, stem cells, and differentiate them to form erythrocytes, and then amazing. you can infect those with malaria. And you can this fool is, with them first, and then do that. This is so amazing. How about that? That you can take almost any cell now. You can take these That's precursors great. and make whatever you want. Ba boom. Oh, I, this bada is bing, just cool. So boom. you can <laughs> modify the stem cell, make it into an erythrocyte, and then put malaria in it and see what happens. So you can muck with genes. You can see what receptor yeah, molecules might so be important. Cool. It's so cool. So that's what they do here. And, and the general approach is to take a whole collection of small interfering RNAs, which will target specific mRNAs. They introduce them into the precursor cells using lentiviral vectors. Look at this. We're all nodding. We're, We're nodding. Crossover. This is cool. <laughs> crossover. So virology rules as usual. Naturally. And Daniel will not disagree because he is a virologist <laughs> at heart. True. Right? This is no, true. No, actually, this is very similar to the paper I just published, which is lentiviruses <laughs> and CD34 positive cells. So this is... You, How about that? You published? This is the future. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> Come on. He's a scholar <laughs> and a gentleman. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and a great physician also. Um, so you, you, you put these lentiviral vectors, basically, containing this library of small interfering RNAs. You infect ah. the precursor cells. I mean, they will, of course, integrate and continue to produce these small interfering RNAs. Right. And then you can ask what would be the effect on malaria invasion, right? Invasion, just invasion. Yeah, invasion. That's now, right. the problem here is that you can imagine that if they use a library of siRNAs against the whole genome, <laughs> some of those are going to interfere with the exact differentiation yeah, yeah, well, process, yes, right? That's right. That's so right. they first have to get rid of those. Those are lethals anyway. So yeah, so gone. those are the ones that would be missing when you go yeah, through this right. process. So they, right. they actually, this is why the Broad is involved because they have big time <laughs> sequencing. Yeah, they they, do. So they infect their precursor cells and then differentiate. And then they ask what siRNAs are missing. <laughs> by, exactly. deep, by deep sequencing, all the siRNAs that are in this resulting population, and they assume that the ones missing were missing because they killed or they prevented differentiation. Right? Maybe, maybe. So then they ask of the ones that are. You understand, Dixon? Are you so on, far are you, so good? Are you on board? Not just on board. <laughs> we had a lunch yesterday, and I went through the whole paper with Daniel and the work. Well, so you're cheating. I, I'm actually doing my work for a change. <laughs> you're cheating. <laughs> Trying to bring myself up to speed. You know, here, guys. he never reads the papers. This beforehand. is not true. Well, I could, I could tell that. This is really only not true. when you arrived on the scene. You did something to him no, that I could not, not do. I, you I got was, him to read the papers. Stop it, you know what? Both I, of you. I, I, I'm making science exciting for for our <laughs> listeners and Dixon. You know, <laughs> kids. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that only I one, can say that. I'm sure at one time you read papers. <laughs> I actually. 
wrote papers at one time too. But well, those over days on Twiv, we we depend on Dixon to ask questions. He listens while during the show, no, and you ask is, a question. This is brand new stuff for you too. Come on, forward genetic screens. Now, forward genetic screens are not terribly new. No, we'll name some cells in the body that don't have nuclei besides red cells. That's a question for you, Mr. Smarty Pants. Ladybugs. Stop it. <laughs> okay, name another one. <laughs> no, no, no. What other what other applications what? would this fit into? Well, that oh. actually becomes the sort of the you know our platelets cells would be. The answers. Would be Those the are other. bits of cells. What? No, well. but there's one other cell that's really important. That's not nuclear. It doesn't have a nucleus. Be- besides erythrocytes. Yeah. Is that right? Does a sperm cell have a nucleus, Vince? Uh, does a sperm cell have a nucleus? It has a Nabenkern. <laughs> it's got nucleic acid, though. It has nucleic acid, but it doesn't have a nucleus per se. Mm. So you might yeah, think of that as another cell. cell to- is that really a cell? Exactly. No, it's a half. A, <laughs> it's just like an ovum is only a half of a cell, right? So, yeah. so those would so not be. Ova? Do ova have nucleus? Well, they have a nucleus. That's for sure. The nucleus is there with yeah. the envelope and everything, but yeah. not in the sperm cell, though. I don't think it's there. Why do you think that is? Excuse me. Let me put it another way. What How do you function? think that arose in What is the function of not having a nucleus in a sperm cell? Could not possibly. More easy access for the DNA to get out and go into uh, well, the egg, you think? There is one interesting facet to that fertilization process, which I've always been in awe of, and that is that all of the mitochondria come from the female. All of them. Hmm. Right? So what is the Nabenkern? Labenkern? Naben. Nabenkern? Nabenkern. I don't know. What is that? It's a portion of the sperm cell, yeah. which is behind the head but prior to the tail. And it contains some material that's mm-hmm. essential for fertilization. But uh, So now that you bring this up, you could yeah. take stem cells, differentiate them yeah, into sperm, right. and do the same kind you of could. siRNA. Or, and then you could say what genes are necessary for... Penetration? Proper morphology, ah, penetration. Or, sure, of course. So they then take a bunch of genes that they think might be important for. Um, I was going to bring up. I sort of. I got a yeah. little uneasy when people start genetically manipulating um, germline cells, right? Because we're not really <laughs> supposed to do that in human beings. No, you could do it in mice. <laughs> okay. Because, yeah, here it's great to take the 34 positive cells, which contain mostly progenitors, but some so stem cells. So those you can get from blood, right? You just. Well, you can. But there are very few circulating. If you want mm. to get them from blood, you can give people GCSF, which will mobilize them. GCSF? Them what? GCSF, granulocyte colony ah, stimulating colony factor. factor. Not GMCSF. Um, not GM, just GCSF. good old G. Okay. Um, which apparently is not as popular as GM. It is not. Or, <laughs> or is Ford or Toyota. Whenever I, whenever, I mention, whenever I mention that, people are like, you mean GM? I'm like, no, yeah, actually, not the, me. not the car company. This is. <laughs> or, or, and what they did in this case, or you actually anesthetize, put a large bore needle into someone's bone. It's usually at Leah Crest. Yeah, this is horrible. And that's right. where that's where they're getting. They're getting these. bone marrow. Yeah, uh, they're getting bone. And then you take from the bone marrow, and mm. there's a lot of muck in there, and you isolate the 34 positive cells from the bone marrow, and then those. Um, you can differentiate into any of the blood cell lineages, so your lymphoid. So it is my understanding that in very in a variety of virus vector therapies, they they want to take CD thirty four positive stem cells, but they do it from blood because the bone marrow is a bitch. They and um, it's kind of painful, and people don't yeah. like to do that. So that's true. The, the so you would give them GCSF to amplify the blood borne CD34. It, it basically cells. causes them to um, go from the marrow and um, Comes into out, the yeah. peripheral circulation. Neat. So you do a per- it's called peripheral mobilization. You give them the GCSF, and that's fine. It doesn't and hurt them. No, it doesn't hurt them. And then you draw the blood. You isolate the 34 positive cells from the peripheral blood. And you do that then, how? Then you do, um, you know. Magnetic you, beads? Actually, in most of these um, gene therapy um, protocols, it's magnetic beads. So you've got an antibody that binds 34, but it also binds iron. And then you use magnets to pull those cells out. Did I ever mention, or maybe I did, and I forgot that I did, but because I do that sometimes, mm. that in the old, old days, uh, back at in Rockefeller, Mm-hmm. early formative years Eugene Opie became famous for many things and he was the uh, major professor for Peyton Rouse by the way Eugene Opie uh, isolated Kupfer cells from the liver mm-hmm. by feeding 
uh, single cell suspensions with little iron filings, and then he used a magnet to pull out the Cooper <laughs> cells. Oh, <gosh>. so, <laughs> what a clever! Back to the this is the turn of the yeah. century. This is not modern biology. This is like I wonder what these cells do. Look, they've got stuff in them like bacteria. I wonder if they'll ingest these little particles of iron, and then I wonder if I could use a magnet to. My Nowadays, God. of course, we do use what magnetic beads. What a clever beads man to, he was! To do things. Yeah, so these are that, ideas yeah. that have have a following of technology that goes back to the very beginning of. I don't know who thought about that to begin with, but you know what they say, Dixon? There, ne- there are no new ideas. I do know that. You do. I, do. I know that. Mm. But you build on old <laughs> ideas to make new ideas you out stand of old on the ideas. Shoulders of giants. Right? You, well, that's a common. Whose shoulders did you stand cliches? on? Cliches. Many. Many. Rene Dubois. Many. You know, they did hear that seems funny to me. Then, after all this, they chose to focus on a subset encoding human blood groups. 42 well, different genes. Wonder you know why that was. Well, Do you yeah, wonder? Yeah, Dixon, why did they focus on human <laughs> blood groups? Well, thank you for asking the question, Vincent, because I might not even be able to answer that one. Because sure there would. are other malarial parasites which are restricted in their host range for cell types yeah. by blood groups like Duffy blood group for instance yeah. so Plasmodium vivax infects Duffy blood group positive cells yeah. and Duffy blood group negative cells exist in West Africa and some other places too and I'm sure that Dr. Right. Griffin will be glad to tell well, us which it species come, it of malaria up, they will actually take cells from these people to validate of course their, of course their results yeah, yeah and thalassemia the, major and minor but the reason I'm bringing this up is yeah, well, everything they've done so far yeah. mm-hmm. You didn't need to do. All you had to do was take these 42 <laughs> blood group genes and knock them well, down. yeah, they could have done that. They could have done that. I mean, the others are very nice, but <clears throat> yeah. right. well, I think they, they it, made sure that none of these 42 <laughs> actually affected differentiation, yeah. which is fine. But right. So you could say their entire first figure was so that they could do the second figure. The first figure was to say, we validated that yeah, this isn't going mean, to mess. So, kind of that. Not so I, I would ask the question, and I asked it yesterday at lunch, what is the biological significance of the diversity of blood group substances in humans? Well, I'm sure you know the answer, Dixon. Yeah, and I don't know the answer. No, I didn't know the answer either. I don't know the answer, Vincent. What is the answer? I'm sure it has to do with infections of various sorts. Because, you know, um, neuroviruses. Do you know any viruses? That neuroviruses. Are, really? Absolutely. There are blood group specific? Blood group antigens, which happen to be present on some bacteria in the gut. Uh, and they allow the virus to bind and get trans. Wow. Cytosed across wow. the gut lumen, and these are mostly yes. complex carbohydrates. Yes, right? correct. Yeah. I'll bet a lot of it has to do That's with that. That's fascinating, and also oxygen tension in different locales. Yeah, because eventually, if you trace us back, <laughs> <laughs> we're down to the old Ivy Gorge again. Four hundred thousand people. Well, I and came the next from thing Mars, you know, actually. <laughs> yes, I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> Along with uh, Michael Jordan and several other people. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Now, who would? That uh, be? He was such a wonderful basketball player. He's he couldn't possibly players, have come yes. from underwear salesman, or rapper, something. Hanes, isn't he a Hanes, spokesman yeah, for Hanes? Hanes. For Hanes um, but yeah, no. I mean, CD fifty five, right? As we're going to discuss, is something that. Um, Different viruses will use for entry, right? Some NRO, Coxsackie. I worked on CD55, and I had a student who did a project because it binds a certain enterovirus, enterovirus 70. It's the receptor, and it happens to be the same protein that is the title of this paper. How about that? The mind Dixon, what is the reason that both (laughs) viruses and parasites depend on a particular, the same protein? The reason? Yeah, no, I can't give you reason? a reason. I can give you the biological how it reason. works. What's the, the biological the reason of that? <laughs> biological reason. Well, I'm struck by the fact that almost everybody is susceptible to Plasmodium falciparum. So this is a, a bit of a conundrum for me to think about. Why? Everybody uh, has unless CD55. Unless all red cells have CD55 on them. But remember, it's not the only thing that's important. But I read this paper, and I can tell you now that some people don't have CD55. There really? are groups of people out there that have no CD55. Yeah, and are they resistant to malaria? They are. Mm-hmm. So what's your point? This malaria. What's your point? Well, I guess that restricts this parasite in terms of its host range. Yeah, well, you just said everyone's susceptible to malaria, but obviously that's no, not falciparum, true. No, falciparum. Okay. I meant falciparum. Right. Because I, I just told you about another one that is restricted by blood yeah. group substances, but this is not a blood group substance. CD55 is not a blood group substance, right? It's a protein. It is a protein on the surface of cells. As opposed to these complex carbohydrates. 
this this is con- yes, but the human. This is a blood group component. It's CD fifty five is a blood group. component? It's considered to be part of the blood group component. Yeah. Would you actually that's they, that's chemically put that in that category? Look, we chose to focus on a small subset of erythrocyte proteome encoding human blood groups. Well, I don't and see well, CD fifty five as a blood group substance. Well, that's part of their forty two genes, dude. Yeah, but that might be true. You but should take it up with them. It's considered part of the human blood group proteome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm confused then as to what you consider you a confused? blood group. Well, I don't know what your definition of a blood so, group well, is. Maybe we, so maybe we should talk about what are the blood. What are? <laughs> Let's try what that defines, first. What defines the blood group. How many different so, blood group types are there out there? First of all, there really actually are a lot. There's a tremendous um, right because number. it's going to be how many different proteins make up this blood group. Now. I'm going to extend, I'm going to say proteome, but the blood groups are defined not only by the expression of certain surface proteins, but also by the expression of certain surface sugars. Right. Right. And, right. and I, you know, I mean, I don't know if we know why, but I think there has been selection based upon different pathogens that that has caused some, you sure. know, some of these obvious to be. like to like Duffy is the classic. Natural right? selection has to be at um, work here, right? Now, some of them, like CD55, um, can have slight variants. Very few people, right, this cohort in Japan that will come up, um, have almost no expressions. Most people, if they can't express CD55, which is attached with this GPI anchor, which maybe we'll talk about, they have some problems. Um, So so I think that there's a certain advantage to a parasite that selects a certain protein in the um, blood group proteome that has a very important secondary function. So my... Sugars are stuck on the protein. Yes, I do know. This is a, I know that they're called decorations. Really? <laughs> they are. <laughs> do you, are there interior decorators? <laughs> These are exterior a, decorators. Exterior decorators. Oh, I heard a fantastic enzymes. presentation here about decorating <laughs> proteins with, with carbohydrates. Exterior decorators. Uh, perhaps, yes. perhaps. But So my, my limited reading on CD55, including mm. a Wikipedia article, which was pretty accurate, I would say, uh, would says you know? because it was heavily referenced. <laughs> It must have had your papers in it. No, I don't have anything on CD55, but it said that CD55 protein yeah. interacts with the complement cascade Correct. to remove it rapidly. It's a regulator, yeah. To keep you from lysing your own cells open. It's a regulator of complement, RC. Right. So how does that fit into a blood group substance? That doesn't, that doesn't jive at all. Multifunction. That's jive talk, baby. <laughs> because carbohydrates are attached to it. Those are the BGs. Remember that jive talk? Don't you agree that proteins can have multiple functions? I have, of course I do. Okay, there you go. Of course I do. <laughs> Let's go through the screen. Shall we? It's really cool. Well, do that. They have these these lentes encoding these 40 small interfering RNAs for these 42 different human blood group genes. <laughs> okay, that's Dixon. a lot. But they're of, of the total number, that's not a lot. It's not a lot. But that's what they chose to focus on. They put them into the, the CD34 positive precursors. You make right. stables. And then you differentiate them to right. form erythrocytes. And then they infect them. Or they try to infect them. With... A P. falciparum containing green fluorescent Ooh. protein. You know this, already. Marty Chalfie protein. Because you've read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I do know this. Actually, part. it's not Marty Chalfie protein. He was the first to put know, the know, gene into another organism. The, the Japanese investigator was the exactly. first one. Exactly. He actually yeah, sure. discovered it. And so you know, if right. you are in the waters uh, offshore here at night oh, and yeah. you take a, a little net and you just run it below the surface, you will see all this fluorescence. You will. You will. Because the jellies. Get excited when you push them around. There I th- are I always lots found of algae with it in there too, by the way. I found that fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a very common protein. So then they infect with falciparum. Then you can isolate those cells by means of flow cytometry because of the green fluorescence, yes. right? And then you ask which siRNAs are present. But these, they didn't do the infection. They just did attachment. They're only looking at attachment, Vincent. So we have to make this clear. Like your viruses. We infected, as the authors looking. write, we infected the <laughs> yeah, knockdown cells. We read, we read this paper and they didn't infect those cells. Dixon, they I'm, tried I'm to relating them. what the authors said. Understood. Understood. And we are not going to interpret the authors' <laughs> results. They infected them and then they <laughs> sorted by the virtue of fluorescence, green fluorescence, right? So that could be stuck on the surface or it could be be inside, right, Dixon? They had to do it really quick, though. Then they they, ask, what is missing? There wasn't time for the total infection to occur. what is missing? What is missing? What is missing? 
So you that, S- the genes that were the siRNAs the that were missing, IRA. they assumed were important for the plasmodium to, let's call it, infect the cells, right. even though you don't like infections. Right. right. Well, I, we're looking at attachment. I, I wanted to make a process here for you so that you could relate it to the viruses that you're so used to. Where is this plasmodium getting to when they add it to these erythrocytes? Just to the surface of the membrane. I mean, la- later on, and I maybe with the cart's getting me the horse, later on we're going to actually say, does it just stick to the outside and that's why they're green, right. or does it actually get in? But this, right. figure does, this figure doesn't actually make that distinction. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So there's, right. a, there's an exposure. But this is quick. This is really yeah. quick, though, right? They throw the parasites on with fluorescent green protein, and then right afterwards they start so- cell sorting. How quick afterwards do they do it? What's the yeah? When you say quick, how quick is that? It can't be long. (laughs) How long does it take for the parasite to get into the red blood cell? Very good question. Do we know? Yes, we do. How many hours? Actually, it's not an hour; it's a minutes type of thing. Oh, I'm sure they did this for more than a minute. Minute type of thing. Why couldn't plasmodium get inside the cell? What is the title of this paper? Dixon, just answer my question. Why can't the plasmodium get inside the red blood cells under the conditions of this experiment? Well, because I think they, they didn't allow enough time for that to happen. But you said it only takes minutes. Well, they probably did this immediately after adding the parasites. Why don't we look it up? I think we should look that part up. Well, you guys continue. I will look that up. You've got the methods. You have the methods? Yeah, I always, I always read. That's what I read first. I want to figure out what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, tell us how long they incubated the plasmodium with these. Yeah, that, I would like to know that. HHRNA treated red blood cells right. derived from a precursor. Right. I will but, find that, but you guys keep going. So their you assay is going. simply, we take the green cells yes. by virtue of whether plasmodium is on the outside or the inside. It really doesn't matter at this point. And we see what siRNAs are missing. But you have three different kinds of green things then. You'd have a green thing not attached to anything. You have a green thing attached to a red cell. They gate for the red blood cell. Another Dixon. green thing that's inside they the They can red tell cell. the difference in size. You They're gating from red blood cells. Okay. Do you understand? I do. Okay. The, the little plasmodium greens, they throw them away. They don't want just those by themselves. They want red blood cells that are green. So you can say what big cell is green. You can do that in a flow cytometer. You got that, Dixon? No, I don't got that because if it's only attached to the outside vent, since it's twice, almost twice the size so? of the What's cell the that has that? a parasite inside, it doesn't of it. matter. But you said it's a gated thing; it's a size thing. They can set the size to whatever they want. Yeah, so what did they so want? So if it's it's red blood cell plus plasmodium, they gate it to say take all cells that are that size. That size, okay. Okay, that's fine. This is not an issue <laughs> at all. You're, you're being picky. You have then to be picky. Take, You've got to be picky. No, you don't have to be picky. <laughs> then you take that and you sequence all the siRNAs that are in those cells yeah. and you ask what's missing. Because what's missing tells you what probably was needed for the plasmodium either to attach to or to get into the cell. That's the assumption that's made. It makes sense to you, Dixon? I know it's complicated. The other way I would have thought the siRNAs RNA that are already inside the cell they inhibited the proteins that you think are important, so they would not have parasites attached to them. That's what I just said, Dixon. We're having a violent agreement. <laughs> I said they look for the That's siRNAs right. that are missing from the population in these cells that are green. What's missing? We put in 42 which ones are missing because those didn't allow the erythrocytes to get green because they were important for uptake. So those are the cells that you want to concentrate on, then. not the ones that got attached to, the ones that well, didn't get attached to. Well, you don't actually have those cells. It's by inference that they're missing. Uh, are you okay, dude? That You didn't say that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and this guy is so calm. You can tell he's a doctor. <laughs> he's still looking for the length of time that they... I'm, so, I'm multitasking, actually. Multitasking. So no, basically, it, it almost would be more intuitive for Dixon if they had sorted the ones that hadn't gotten infected and said, right. look at all the stuff that yeah, got but exactly. can't, you can't. But we, we got to make that mental leap from... <laughs> it's the okay. Ones, we, the ones we that had it. parasites attached to them did not have the proteins missing that were necessary for yeah, attachment. That's right. So, so, what so they, the SRNAs... Yeah. So they sequenced all those SIs and they say, oh, look, they're all here except exactly. CD55 no, right. no, and CD44. You got it. Now, so it's, it's, it's the absence of SRNAs that are... Important. You still have to test it, obviously. Oh, but of course. Right? But you start with, uh, these two are missing, no, so maybe it. they're important. You got it. So you validate them. You got right? it. Uh, right. And you validate them no, by producing that. individual S- siRNAs against either one of these, sure. right? And then you ask, sure. does it prevent you malaria? Do. And it does. It, it, it reduces substantially uh, parasitemia well, and so forth. Well, that's another right? question entirely. You use the word substantial, and I'm going to come 30% back to that. reduction. Is that a big deal? 
it depends what uh, the big deal is. If you're some, infected with Plasmodium falciparum. You know, it's not going to be 100% ever. You know, why? biology is not 100%. Isn't it true, though, for your viruses? For, it's either there or true? it's not. Well, it if depends. If it's not there, you don't get infected. It depends what this thing is you're talking about. N'est-ce pas? Because for some viruses, you need two proteins. That doesn't matter. For others, if either are one. missing, then you don't get infected, right? Am I not right? Uh, this Dixon. is much more complicated. There is a reduction, but this isn't the only protein involved. But Dixon. what you're not asking right. the right question of is, is how does malaria attach to a red cell to begin with? Well, that's not what they're doing here, right? Well, they're looking at attachment, aren't they? Well, that happens later. Okay, we're going to get to that experiment. Yeah, I think later, the, later we... Viruses later don't we... secrete stuff, but parasites <laughs> do. And that's what makes it attach. Why don't you go talk to these guys, Dixon? <laughs> they have rope trees. Look at, so... <laughs> They do. Yes. Rope trees. They do. They're apicomplex and they have rope trees. CD44 and CD55, they, they independently knock down right. in their system. Right. They knock down in the CD44 positive cells. They make erythrocytes. They infect with plasmodium, and then they assess parasitemia. Right. And they say there's a 30% reduction in parasitemia in cells yes. deficient for either 44 or 55 relative to controls. And those are totally different proteins. Absolutely, totally, and completely different. <laughs> what I also worked on CD44. Yeah, I'm sure you did. So what happens when they're both missing? They didn't do that. Why? I, there's no technical reason why Excuse they should me. have. They, they could have done, done that, and then they could have said, together, it's 100%. So, Dixon, if you reviewed this paper, would you have asked for that experiment? You bet your sweet Yeah, babies. I think that's a good... And this goes to show that you just because You mean to tell science, me I didn't understand this paper? Who of said course that? I did. Who said I didn't understand You know, understand I knew the it. guy who looked at malaria going into red cells... You are just chip-on-shoulder very... person No, today. no, I'm going to tell you my experiences now. You keep talking wait, wait, about your stop, work with stop, polio. stop, stop. Before you go on, yes. just because it's in science doesn't mean it's a great paper. This is all true. But this is an interesting paper. It's very interesting, but it doesn't go far now, enough. Now, what, what do you want to tell us that you did with plasmodium? No, I haven't done anything with plasmodium. But I, I went to school with the person who first observed malaria penetrating a red cell underneath the microscope. Little did he know that CD44 time. and 55 were involved. He had no involved. clue. He had no <laughs> clue. Did you find that yet, Daniel? You know, I've seen that where they where they mention that they uh, the temperature. I know the temperature. How long would you wait, Dixon, if you were doing this assay? Well, it depends on what my question was, doesn't it? How long would you wait? I'm asking the question: Does a molecule on the surface of mm. the red cell prevent attachment? No, not attachment. Of- They're looking at uptake, right? It no. includes attachment and some other process. Well, that. maybe there are two different here, processes. Here they call it invasion in the title, right? Yeah, I know, but so that's, invasion that's a is loose a, term. Is attachment and then taking up into the cell. Just like viruses attach and then they are endocytosed, right? Two yes. steps. But one induces the other in viruses. In this one, the parasite is active in both cases. Well, actually... Endocytosis is a constitutive process. Red cells can't endocytose. I'm, not I'm talking sorry about red cells because they don't have a nucleus. Dixon, in virus infection. Yeah, no, you're right. Which on that. do not infect red blood cells. No, endocytosis isn't that interesting. Is constitutive, and whatever happens to be bound gets taken up. So viruses do not actually induce correct endocytosis. They do induce other things. Yes, I understand that red blood cells do not endocytose. They don't, okay. but the parasite nonetheless invades. So how so do you that, think the parasite invades then if these cells don't endocytose? Well, it, that's a very interesting question. Some people have devoted their whole careers to find out the answer to that one. So one of them was Dr. Lewis Miller, who was one of my classmates here, and then went on to head the Laboratory for Parasitology at the NIH for a long time. And his whole thesis was based on how do these parasites invade a red cell? How does it work? He was the one that discovered Duffy blood group negative uh, red cells are not susceptible to Plasmodium vivax, but only to Plasmodium ovale. So he was already looking, his laboratory was already looking, and Robert Guadge was part of that laboratory, Mm -hmm. to look to see what the conditions are to allow a red cell to become invaded by a a, uh, eukaryotic parasite. Mm -hmm. And this follows up on that research. So yes. let me let me fast forward to an experiment that addresses some of your questions, please. Which is they um, want to know if CD fifty five is involved in attachment or not, uh-huh. right? Now you got it. So they either attachment or some later stage of invasion. That's what they call it. Okay. They use cytochalasian D. Now yes. what does that do, Dixon? It links up microtubules. And what would that make? 
parasite. It might trap yeah. it onto the surface. Right. So that's what they say. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I got but the assay is GFP, green fluorescent association with the cell. It's either on the outside or it's inside. Okay, that's fine. This experiment, they use cytochalasin D. It freezes the, the plasmodium on the surface, right? And they say initial attachment is not affected whether or not you have CD55. It's but, only the invasion. But they start to detach. The, the fluorescence goes down. So they say it must be uh, affecting invasion, which is getting the parasite within the cell, which Dixon says doesn't well, really Dixon happen. Dixon doesn't say that. He doesn't Lewis really Miller happen. said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it doesn't I think really the, happen. I think the subtle bit of trivia that Dixon is um, holding dear to yeah. is that when it is physically inside the outer cell membrane of the cell, there still is a barrier between it and the Got cytoplasm it. sure. of It's the like cell. being in an endosome in a nucleus. So it's cell, inside, right? but yeah. it's not free-floating. It's a like double cytoplasm. membrane. It's a double membrane. It's an invagination yes. of the red cell's membrane. That's what it lives inside of. Well, that would be like an endosome, and then you have the parasite membrane. Is that what you mean by a double membrane? That's what I mean. Okay, that's fine, but it's still cell-associated. So if for the it's purposes of, course of flow cytometry, of course it, it doesn't matter, okay? I got it's it. fluorescence associated with the but cell. The parasite induces this deformation okay, of the membrane. Okay, that's fine. What? That's fine. It's with its rope tree secretions. Okay. So you don't even believe CD55 is involved at all, right? 30% is I, not good no, enough Involved in what? <laughs> I'm I think asking involved in I what? I think from figure 4E, which we'll hit on, is that we see that the attachment is not different whether or not you have CD55 or not. Right. But when you don't have cytochalasin D and you let the assay go long enough that it's dependent on invasion <laughs> right. in this special double wall thing that right. um, Dixon's very excited about, <laughs> then you see that it's really important. So there's really, we'll say two steps here. The attachment phase is fine. It's probably attaching to something else. But the yes, CD55 likely, yeah. is important in the invasion um, process. I mean, a 30% difference is a difference, right? It is a difference. Well, it, it's different, right? and you could, you, know, you could say you could poo-poo it. Um, but, you know, what we haven't seen is the effectiveness of the short hairpin RNA knockdown. I mean, if we're getting a 90% knockdown, that 10% may still be enough. So, right. you know, when you, you know, 30% shows that this really is important, um, I think the limitations of the assay don't allow you to get too excited about saying, so oh, 30% percent isn't enough. 30% is, is pretty right. good. It's actually delete the gene with CRISPRs. That's exactly. Yeah, you would have <laughs> we to talked completely about that delete. You we have to verify that, that it was deleted. That, that doesn't mean French fries. <laughs> I, stop it. Now you're, no, now those you're are crisps. being demeaning. Those now. are crisps. <laughs> <You're> being, <laughs> <laughs> I would only demean you, Dixon. <laughs> so I, I hope that we will consider putting a video of malaria invading a red cell as part of this presentation because it's, it's really quite, yeah, that's fine. To that. it's quite no good so they conclude dixon that yeah. they believe cd55 is yes. not involved in attachment but no. some other step that's needed for the malaria to get beyond the plasma <laughs> <laughs> the red good. blood cell very careful to do okay. it <laughs> yes okay yeah for sure. invasion but not into the cytoplasm to be free floating there are, there are, but again <laughs> now, at our prior discussion when we were looking at the broader picture of invasion of host cells by eukaryotic parasites there yeah. is one that does go into the cytoplasm and disappears totally and that's trypanosoma cruzi trypanosoma cruzi when it gets into the side of a, of a regular cell it crawls through the membrane but it doesn't create a parasitophorous vacuole it is now in naked cytoplasm and that's where it reproduces and that's why it's never detected because the the cell doesn't have a mechanism for dealing with it. <clears throat> so, Dixon, how could you identify what other cellular components are needed for this whole process? How about <sighs> attachment? You could sure, sure. I could mean, you, could you use see, this and and not go ahead? Well, I I think these, these parasites can attach to any red cell. I don't think it's. What do they attach to? Sugars. I don't think so. They use their secretions from their rope trees to yeah. attach with. It's just like toxoplasma does. But they have to attach to a molecule. They're related. They're Are related. you saying they attach to the lipid bilayer, maybe? They attach to the surface, whatever that is. Hmm. And it's a general type of attachment. But after that, then specific molecules come into play, like, for instance, Duffy blood group for the plasmodium vivax. 
this. Um, so they're trying to identify something similar to that for falciparum. But falciparum, when you look around the world, does not have the same kind of restriction for host invasion mm. as vivax or ovalia. And that's where I'm having my biggest problem. Because I, I don't think there's a similar molecule sitting out there that you can say, well, those people with this molecule don't get plasmodium falciparum and those people with this molecule do. Like you can say for Vivax and Ovalley, that's that's where I'm having my biggest disconnect. They have, I'm looking they, for significance. They have this Dixon. They have this table of geographic distribution yeah. of CD55 coding variants. Right. 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 But <clears throat> that doesn't say anything about susceptibility. No, it does at all, not. Right? It does not. It's just polymorphism. That's correct. Um, but you could, I think, take this data and then ask: Is there any difference in you could. susceptibility you could. to P. falciparum? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Now they have Japanese people who are CD fifty five null. Yes. Right. Yes. And they get they get blood cells from them. Yes. And they show that these also have a defect in uh, uptake of plasmodium. Correct. How big a defect? Is it a hundred percent, or is it less than that? Because with Duffy blood group negative of Vivax, it's 100%. It's one blood group substance, prevents invasion. I don't find the number here offhand. Diminished. Diminished. Proliferation was diminished. Right. I don't, I don't know what the number is. Okay. That's figure 4B. Okay. Figure 4B. Yes, sir. It is... I'll take my paywalled article. Percent parasitemia. Well, the control is 5%, and the CD55 null is zero parasitemia. So those are the blood cells from uh, this Japanese cohort, which right. lacks CD55. So there's really no invasion, which is not the same. I mean, so that could go back to our point before. These SIs are not 100% efficient. So maybe mm -hmm. if you could, then you would not see any invasion, right? True. So That, that might be right. So that's why it's nice. By using the red cells from the CD55 null, you're, you're basically bypassing any limitations of your silencing. Right. And actually seeing a, a pretty impressive um, impact. It's and I think they then, yeah. they then go on to say, you know, using the clinical experience of those patients, that not only are those people doing okay, um, they say hematologically yeah, normal. Yeah, right. they're normal. Um, but there may be some way of targeting CD55 um, and protecting people from um, certain strains yeah, of plasmodium. It would, it would raise the question then for the clotting factor cascade, what is the molecule they use in order to get rid of that? Complement, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how are they protecting themselves from well, complement? It it's got to be redundant, lysis. right? Yeah. Right. So, Another protein fills in for it. And fortunately, there are, because what, what causes trouble, you know, people who have the complement-mediated lysis of red cells, are not when they just are CD55 null, but as I mentioned before, this GPI anchoring, it looks like a number of the um, um, molecules involved in protecting cells from complement mediated lysis involve GPI anchors. So people that are deficient huh. in making the GPI anchors, right. those would be the people with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, where they wake up in the morning with a dark, lysed urine. Listen to those string of words. Because they're, they're not able to protect their red cells quite as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, CD55 huh. by itself, missing that, as we see in these individuals, uh, that's yeah. okay. You can yeah. go forward. Yeah. When you start missing more of the complement protecting um, right. molecules, then you start getting yourself into trouble. So you re earlier you had objected to this being a blood group but they, it is a com determinant for the Cromer blood group system, the CD55. So it's part of that blood group okay, system. So this is a non... Non-carbohydrate. Non-carbohydrate blood group. So my question okay. would be, okay. do they have plasmodium falciparum in Japan? That's a great question, actually. Yeah, was this driven? Was this selected for by... Or because it's an island um, community that never had it, therefore they dropped this out of their repertoire of proteins for other reasons. I mean, it could be other reasons. But was there ever malaria on Japan? I think there know? is malaria in Japan and the southern islands. I think uh, there is. I think there is. Yeah, Okinawa and places like that. Uh -huh. I think, yeah, definitely. Because this, uh, more Japanese died, by the way, in the Second World War from malaria than died from bullets. The same is true for our side, too. So uh, all throughout the uh, South Pacific, but 
half of Japan is almost in South Pacific. Not quite, but it's it's pretty warm and tropical in terms of their temperatures. I mean, because if this is really if lacking this gene is yeah. really not an issue, yeah. you would think yeah. it would have been lacking in countries where there's a lot of malaria. Sure, I mean, right? you go for hemoglobin S deficiency and that sort of thing in Africa, and that does semi protect, yes, right? Exactly. It's got yeah. a heterogeneous, and, and we think that's that's right. maintained because of exactly. its protection, right? It's a balanced polymorphism. Well, it may, as may they bring call. up the issue of how long have we been suffering selective pressure um, from falciparum? Two hundred thousand years. Yeah, is that enough? Is that how long we've yeah. been a human being? <laughs> well, I think. Well, I guess I would say ovale, vivax, um, malaria. Those yeah. those probably have been with us a lot longer. Yeah, we've had longer period. And and when we talk about selection pressure, and you say, oh well, since we've been you know Homo sapiens sapiens, but actually, the selective pressure can work even Could before. In yeah, the, of course, of did course. they look um, at those? By the way, in this paper, ovale and vivax, with respect, they did not. They did look at Nolsey. Yes, right. And we've had a program on Nolsey. And Nolsey had no. This is the animal one that's yeah, migrating. the monkey malaria in Malaysia, okay. and it's on the rise there, by the way. And this had no effect. The lack of CD fifty five had no effect on monkey, invasion. I'm putting malaria. air quotes it, around it invasion. <laughs> Thank you for okay. <laughs> Say minimal effect with a minimal effect. So yeah, that's getting yeah, in yeah, differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are reviews, by the way, uh, the good reviews on the mechanism of uh, invasion of a red cell by the merozoites. So we could quote a few of those Didn't papers as well. Didn't we talk about it in, yeah, of in previous episodes? You know, we had four uh, malaria yeah, we did. episodes. We did. We did. We did. It's an important topic, so we should uh, revisit that every so, now and then. Dixon, what yes. do you really think of this paper? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> no I, we, I'll tell you what we concluded <laughs> when we discussed this informally, and that is that it's a brilliant paper from the standpoint of taking a non nucleated cell and working backwards to the stem cells to produce null varieties of the cells type. So you can start testing out these hypotheses. It's a wonderful system for looking at all of the factors that might be important for parasites to get inside of a red cell. Mm. Now, I need to ask you a question now. Are you serious that there are no viruses that invade red cells? None? No, they have no nuclei. That's quite amazing. Um, so, there are receptors for some viruses on red blood cells. Even reticulocytes that have all the equipment except the nucleus? I mean, I'm just asking a general question now. I'm curious. I'm not aware of any virus that infects That's red amazing. blood cells. No, no, because they have no mitochondria, of course. So there, there, and there's no molecular machinery other than protein synthesis. Many viruses will stick to them. For example, if influenza will stick to red blood cells. Sure. Hemagglutination assay. Yeah, yeah, sure. But they do not infect. Huh. Um, part of the. Part of the issue is probably that there is no endocytosis, exactly, right? Exactly right. However, some viruses do fuse at the cell surface. Okay. 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 So, in theory, those should be able to get their nucleic acids into the red blood cell. But the, what would they do the, when they got there? What's the only mRNA in a red blood cell? Exactly pretty much, right? right? Hemoglobin. <laughs> right? There's not much else. That's right. So the the viruses That's would right. not have what they need. But it has spare parts. I know it does because it builds these uh, parasitophorous vacuoles when the malaria parasite enters. But the size of the red cell doesn't change say, shape. All right, so the size stays the same. Some viruses infect the precursors. So like a parvovirus, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Normal blasts. And what's the disease that that causes? It's slap cheek syndrome, I think. Is that <laughs> Actually, yes. Is that a new baby? Is it fifth, fifth disease, I think. <laughs> fifth disease, and, right. And that's interesting um, because that would be a, uh, if you had someone who was a sickler and they got a parvovirus infection, oh. they can get a really profound anemia. Um, so normal blasts would fall into that category? It's usually earlier, actually. Earlier, okay. Um, yes. All right. So, I mean, when it, so it's still going to be, you know, your normal blast might still have a nucleus. It could be right at the edge, but it's yeah, going it to be your um, erythroid um, progenitor cells that can get right. infected. And I wonder, along the development of a red cell, what causes the nucleus to lose its function? Yeah, why? What was the selection pressure? I wonder for how that works. Not RBCs why, without nuclear. I nuclei. wonder how it works. But it, because what? of avian species <laughs> and reptiles, it's still there. Everyone, everyone else has got them. Why, why have we given up? And the they nucleus? get malaria too, by the way. So do those red cells get virus infections? True. So I'm what about a case? Are we are we ready to move on to a case? No! <laughs> should, we, should we do another case? No, no. I just wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to. Um, 
I don't. I'm not aware of any virus okay. that repli- which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It has been found. But I'm not aware of any that infects any red blood cell. Okay. I just think there's limited yeah. availability of what's yeah. needed to parasitize. This paper sets a very high standard for working with red cells and parasites <clears throat> from a molecular standpoint. Okay. By the way, what does the the malaria need? From a red blood cell. Hemoglobin. Is that all it needs? ATP. Yeah. Lots of ATP. Does the red blood cell make ATP? It has a lot of ATP in it. In it, but it doesn't make it. It's in my mitochondria, right? Right. So it can't make any more you know, ATP. But the parasite uses it all up in it the uses process. Uses it all up. So that's the difference. The parasite is yeah, coming in yeah, yeah, completely right. with most of what it needs. Correct. It's stealing a few things. It has a nucleus. But viruses need a lot more, and that's why it. they probably don't work in red blood cells. Exactly. So that's why we can't make a one-to-one comparison of invasion and infection between viruses and eukaryotic parasites. Well, this is this is why Dick So this is why So I, I apologize <laughs> if I irked your ire. But I wanted you irked to my ire? I wanted to try to make a line between the thought process of a virus That's and right. a parasite at that level. Well this is I think um, I, I call it Dixon's um, his, his blue collar spin on why parasites are better than viruses. <laughs> I don't think they're better. And, uh, they, they're I mean, just the analogy I put forward to him. Oh, no, they're just you've different. Got, you've got the, the really... worker who shows up to do his job, and he's got the tool belt and all the tools and everything, and you've got the supervisor who just sort of shows up with nothing, <laughs> and he's going to tell everyone else what to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the virus. The virus shows up, it's going to tell the host what to do, but it doesn't bring you enough, think viruses you know. are not as good as parasites, but viruses <laughs> are parasites. That. He said that. Viruses are parasites. He said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> let's do another case. All right, let's do a case. Before we get uh, Dixon in too much trouble, I'm not in trouble here, guys. All right. Don't worry as, about as that. As Dixon would say, he can't, he can't get in trouble. No, I'm beyond trouble. <laughs> okay. We have a. Uh, this is also another recent case, but uh, I've seen a lot of cases like this. A 28 year old man presents with a headache for two weeks. He's got a low grade fever, and uh, there's some change. This is, I guess, this is, I'm realizing this is medical jargon, a change from baseline in his mental status. Uh, basically, his roommate who brings him in says, he's a little different, and he's got weakness in his left arm. He was brought into the ER at a hospital on Long Island after his friend noticed that he fell to the floor and had shaking motor activity. This might remind us of some previous shaking cases. But he gets brought in like right away. This is the first time. They don't wait for the second else. event. Yeah, right. um, the patient was confused. He gets brought in um, by ambulance. And so the tough thing, right? Here's a guy who's... Um, not giving us a lot of history. We're getting most of it from his roommate, his friend. Um, he's not coherent? He, he's a little confused, actually. He's a little confused. Does he know his name? Um, he does know his name. He knows where he's from? He knows where he's from. Does he know where he has been? But it does take a while. It takes a while before he If you ask him, where have you been, does he know yeah. that? Yes, he does. How and many his fingers? friend knows that, too? How many his fingers? Knows that. <laughs> exactly right. How many fingers have I got in your eyes? Do we count the thumb? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. I had a big discussion with oh, Marlene that's a good about point. that. point. Yes. We have ten toes. Many... Well, you have eight fingers. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, that's always the subtlety of assessing their mental what status. What do you ask them, Daniel? How many digits do you see? Like a one? How many twenty dollar bills do I have in my wallet? <laughs> so he, uh, so we go through, you know, any past medical history, things I should know. He is he shaking at this point? No, at this point he is, uh, you know, still a little confused. Did you but do he's no longer shaking. strength determinations in both arms? Well, first, first we talked to him. Okay, we're gonna, fine. we're gonna do that. Don't oh, okay, worry. We'll sorry. do that. Sorry. <laughs> Jumping ahead again as usual. Um, so he doesn't tell us of any past medical history. He doesn't tell us of any surgeries. Um, he doesn't. He's unable to tell you, or he says no. He, not, he, he denies everything. Okay. Like, is there anything I should know? Any medicines you're on? Nothing allergic to anything. <coughs> Anything's in the family. Tell me how old again. Are you on any medication? He's twenty eight. Is he married? Um, he's ah. not. He's not married. <laughs> well, that rules um, that out. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what is he rolling out? Vince had a question here, but so, he's going to withhold. Is, he's, not, he's not married. But the, he doesn't have any kids. Spousal stress? What are we? <laughs> Could have kids. <laughs> doesn't have to be married for No that. kids that we know about. That's right, or he knows about. Yeah. Should we ask questions now or not? Sure. Is he sexually okay. active? He is sexually. He reports being very sexually active with multiple partners. Has he had uh, all his childhood vaccines? Yes. Wow. Oh. Yeah, he grew up actually in this country. When and was he, his last physical examination? 
Oh, he hasn't seen a doctor since he was hasn't a kid. Hasn't seen any doctor. Has he been out of the country lately? Uh, um, only local travel. Only local travel. He lives, you know, in Queens. And what does he eat? Anything unusual? No, he says no, no particular dietary. Uh, has he ever had this happen before? No, this is the first time this has happened to him. The very first time. Has he so, been bitten by a rodent lately? Well, that's a good question. No, he reports no, uh, no, no bites, no rodent Rat bites. Bite fever. What time of year is this? Summer. Uh, this is recently, right? So we're we'll say March. March. Yeah. No evidence of travel. No prior history. Okay, then physical examination. You don't want to ask any more questions? Yeah, oh, yeah, lots of them. Yeah, let's, Vincent <clears throat> likes to ask the questions. So do you... Go for it, Vince. And he is he's sexually active. He is sexually active. And so you have multiple partners? Yes, with multiple partners. And um, is he is he um, heterosexual? Yes. Mm. And? And bisexual? Yes. He is bisexual. Yes, he's uh-huh. bisexual. <clears throat> okay. And, with an apparent um, neurologic defect affecting his left side. Yeah, his left arm, right? Just the arm is, is the problem? Is that called a hemiparesis? <laughs> it's just the left arm. Um, he also reports, I'll give you, he has toxic habits. You know how I say? He likes to, yeah, to drink alcohol and, smoke. and recreational drugs. Recreational drugs. Recreational yes. drugs. Does he smoke? Um, he, he does smoke, yes. Of course. Wow. Roger that. Does he trim his fingernails? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you ask? It's a general health habit. <laughs> is he overweight, underweight, or normal weight? Um, he is. He so we'll, we'll go to the physical. Now oh, good. No, let's go. One more question. Wait, yeah, one more question. question. Yeah. More sociology. Um, when he does have sex, is it usually protected or not? No, not protected. True. All right. And uh, what's the frequency of his sexual activity? It's frequent. Very frequent, huh? Mm-hmm. Does he live alone? He lives with his roommate, the man who brought him in. Okay. Does he like to canoe on rivers or anything like that? You know, he doesn't report any outdoor um, activities. He doesn't go sailing. He doesn't do anything of that no. sort. Okay. No hiking on the AT. Right. Does he have <laughs> or a, the PCT. Does he have a job? <laughs> he is currently out of work. Does he have any pets? Uh, he does not have any pets. No pets. Does his friend have pets? His friend does not have pets. Okay. His friend who brought him in, you mean? Yeah. Is the friend who brought him in a, his friend or a, partner? a lover? I think a partner. A partner. A partner. Okay. And, but he does not live with this, this No, they do, they do live together. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, vitals. He's um, low-grade temperature, 100.4. Blood pressure, 135 or 85. Heart rate in the high 90s. Breathing about 16. Um, as I mentioned, he was initially confused, following commands, but then um, he um, became more lucid. His um, friend, partner, had reported that he was not in his usual state. Um, he's rather thin. Um, on exam, he's got a white coating on his tongue and sort of a white um, lacy coating on his, um, say, buccal muco- mucosa. You open the mouth. Geographic and tongue? The, he has geographic no, tongue? No, not really geographic, just a white coating on the tongue and then What's this lacy white tongue? appearance. You have a map on your tongue, Dixon? Yeah. <laughs> like North America? Could be. <laughs> South America? Belize? You pick the country. <laughs> Stick your tongue out and I'll tell you which one. <laughs> I have a white coating. You know, geographic tongue, as an aside... Um, can actually be really a disturbing um, um, change in the tongue that people can sometimes get. I actually had a patient commit suicide over geographic tongue. He was so disturbed by the appearance. Yeah, it was very... And uh, yeah, it's you get this patchy wanna, map-like appearance. Yeah, this is only when you have the white coating. Is that so? This is ah, di- yeah, this yeah, is yeah, not yeah. geographic tongue. Right, this right, is right. a white coating on the tongue and a white lacy um, You'd, on the. The inside Guess of the mouth. Guess some fungal thing. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, lungs everybody are clear. Knows the heart's normal. That is. His belly's soft. Um, he does have um, left arm and left hand weakness. Does. Uh, I'm not seeing any skin lesions no on him. No costal margin liver? No. No. We're not no able pain to... upon palpation of the abdomen? No. No. Normal bowel movements? Um, he doesn't report any abnormalities in his bowel movements. Uh, Blood work? 
Um, I don't think I give you blood work. I don't think no. I give you anything else. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Um, oh, I think okay. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna right, leave right. you there, All and right. then you no know, foot drop. No, it's really the left arm, left hand um, that so is somewhere. That is weak. So localized. The, the thoracic level of vertebra, perhaps. <laughs> okay, so Dixon you, is speculating now. No, I'm just trying to pinpoint the lesion. <laughs> that's all. You would not call this acute. Flaccid paralysis, would you? I would not call it acute flaccid paralysis. Well, this is an episodic seizure. Right. Wouldn't you call it that? Well, he did. I, I would describe it's consistent, as we talked about last time, with a seizure activity where he lost consciousness, had the motor activity, and then there was a period of confusion, I would say. And then he recovered. Something consistent with a post-ictal or right. post-seizure state. Then he recovered. Um, but we're seeing this this weakness. Um, well, that's my other question: is follow up a day later or a week later? Is the weakness still there? The, the, and so the weakness was not acute onset with the seizure; it proceeded uh, 